Welcome, everyone. I'm Wendy Chun Hoon. I serve as the director of the Women's Bureau. And I am just inspired by this packed room. <laughs> and I know that a lot of folks are tuning in online to today to our Equity in Focus Summit. I have to say, from day one of this administration, it was clear that getting back to normal was not going to work for most women. We needed to build a new normal. Women carry the joy and also the burdens of our nation's families. And it's past time that our nation's work policies reflect the needs of working women. A year ago, as the bipartisan infrastructure law was becoming a reality, we started sparking conversations about the fact that this was a historic investment in our nation's roads and bridges and broadband and clean energy. And it's also a historic investment in new jobs, in good jobs, in union jobs. However, when women represent less than 4% of the construction trades workforce, we have to see this moment as not only an opportunity, but as an obligation to deliver greater gender and racial equity. Over the course of the past year, we've worked with so many of you in this room, unions and tradeswomen, and I'm sort of expecting it. <laughs> and care, care advocates and federal partners, mayors, policymakers, thinkers, doers in the room to help reimagine what economic recovery means for women and particularly women of color. We partnered with Cornell's Worker Institute because they too are laser focused. <laughs> because they are laser focused on creating an inclusive and equitable economy. And we are so grateful for our collaboration on this series of the Equity and Focus webinars with many of you leaders in the room, lifting up the breakthroughs, big and small, that you're seeing in your work to really value care work and to get more women in jobs that will be funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. You, you may have watched one of these webinars over the course of the year, um, and if you haven't yet, let me encourage you to take a look. Each webinar really served as the spark for the conversation that we're gonna have today. We want you to use today, use this time together, share ideas with each other, be inspired, make contacts, make commitments to each other, and follow up after the summit to take these ideas to scale in your own community. And I also want to welcome all of you to get to know the Women's Bureau better, our staff across the country who can be partners to you in this work. And so Women's Bureau team, please either stand or just wave so folks can recognize you. <laughs> all huddled up here, apparently. <laughs> We, we at the Women's Bureau, we're a small but mighty agency. We've got a hundred year history in fighting for a just society. We provide data and policy analysis on the state of working women. We engage stakeholders both in DC and across the country. We also run grants programs to fund community-based organizations through our WANTO grant to expand pathways for women to enter and succeed in non-traditional occupations and through our FAIR grant to ensure that women know their rights in the workplace. The new normal is one where our careers are determined by our interests, not our genders. <laughs> where women-dominated fields are paid family-sustaining wages, where every one of us feels safe in our workplace, and where we have what is necessary to care for our families and our health when we need to with things like paid leave. Today is an opportunity for all of us to join together to realize this change, and we really couldn't do it without the partners like our co-host and now friend, Patricia Campos Medina, the Executive Director of the Worker Institute at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell. Patricia. Buenos dias a todos. As you heard, uh, my name is Patricia Campos Medina, and I am the Executive Director of the Worker Institute at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. Since 1940, the ILR School has worked with policymakers, business and labor leaders, worker justice organizations, non-for-profits, and community groups to improve the lives of workers. 
as the preeminent educational institution in the world, focus on work, employment, and labor relations, we are dedicated to generating and disseminating knowledge that improves the lives of workers, transforms the future of work, and advances collective bargaining rights and collective power for workers. <laughs> Centered on our mission, our work at the Work Institute seeks to address one critical theme, inequality in work. We believe that inequality is a major social and economic challenge of our time, made worse by the impact of COVID-19 on essential workers and on women, and specifically on women of color. That is why we are delighted to partner up with the Women's Bureau and with Wendy and her team uh, to advance this critical conversation today on how policymakers, practitioners like you, and academics like us can come together and imagine a future of work that cares about workers themselves. The federal government is engaging in unprecedented levels of investment in job creation not since, since the New Deal. Through current investments in infrastructure and in green energy, we have the opportunity to redefine career paths for women in the construction trades. And as our policymakers continue to debate critical reforms needed in our care economy, Workers on the ground continue to bear the brunt of taking care of our loved ones while they themselves do not have care. Our society, in our society today, workers who provide care lack care themselves. And as we continue to expand investments in our traditional apprenticeship programs, we must also look to innovate and redesign our future of care infrastructure so that it also creates career paths for women. But before I get started and we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that some of our colleagues, um, brothers and sisters who were joining us from Puerto Rico, uh, were not able to come uh, because they had, you know, because of the tragedy that happened with uh, Hurricane Fiona. So I want to acknowledge why they're not here. They wanted to be here and part of these discussions because Puerto Rico is engaged now in a, in a lot of um, uh, hard work to figure out their future moving forward. They cannot be here, but I think we, uh, uh, in their absence, should recommit ourselves to uh, advancing policies and supporting the workers in Puerto Rico as they uh, reconstruct and as they develop a path forward for themselves in Puerto Rico. So let's just acknowledge the presence. As a Latina woman uh, of indigenous descent from Central America, I also want to acknowledge that this is Hispanic Heritage Month. So, by focusing on equity and equity at work, we are also honoring the contributions of Hispanics, the Latino, the Latinx, the indigenous uh, communities of, uh, of Latin America who are part of our workforce and are part of the engine that gives, um, um, that drives economic growth in the United States. So let's celebrate and honor, do the work today together so that we can advance all of us and including the Hispanic American community as part of the Hispanic Heritage Month. Feliz Dia de la Herencia Hispana. Uh, over 400 people are here today, all of you. We are going to work together. We are going to share our experiences together. We are going to learn from each other. And, um, and we have today a unique opportunity to use federal infrastructure resources, investment, and dollars on the ground to push for policies that value women's work. Let's remember that all work has value and all work should be dignified. By focusing on equity and job creation, we will move the needle forward in equity for women in the workplace. We thank you all of you for joining us at this summit today, and we look forward to continue working together, driving big ideas, big innovation, big research, so that what you do on the ground gets acknowledged and elevated, duplicated, and implemented, a big, and we can drive policy change in this country that, uh, so that we can value women's investment um, in this economy. Muchísimas gracias. Sigamos luchando por trabajo dignos, con beneficios y con unión. Muchísimas gracias. Enjoy the day. <laughs> Awesome, Patricia. Um, it is our pleasure to now introduce an incredible advocate for women in the trades, Latino and Latina workers and union members, a plumber herself. She's a dynamic leader. 
<laughs> a dynamic leader who makes it her mission to create a supportive environment within the trade organizations to help others succeed. Please welcome Christina Berrias. Hello, everyone, brother, sisters and brothers. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Wendy, Patricia, for letting me be here. Um, yes, I'm a plumber, 22 years. I got into the trade when I was a makeup artist. That's when I decided to join this trade. And I am part of that 3 to 4% of women. Um, back when I started, it was 3%. And we wanted to increase that. And unfortunately, it hasn't. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's discrimination, harassment, uh, sexism, you know, retaliation. Those are true, true things that happen in this trade and things that we need to work towards to end. And uh, I am the chair for Chicago Women in the Trades. It's a great organization that works. Yes, my <laughs> people. Um, that works towards helping recruit women to come into non-traditional trades, which is great. And we are working on retaining those women because getting them in isn't enough. We have to keep them in, and we have to make sure that we hold people accountable for that. Um, I am also now the national organizer for the Labor Council of Latin American Advancement, which works, <laughs> which works for uh, women's rights, workers' rights, because when we will help uh, rights of all workers, we all succeed. It doesn't matter where you're from, who, or what nationality you are. We have to work together. Um, and in saying this, um, I am very honored to um, introduce our next guest, an advocate, somebody that's fighting for us, that's making and trying to create real change so we can become more of this, uh, this job cycle and equity uh, inclusion that is coming um, forward. And that's being created by this administration. You know, there's a lot of things happening and we have to keep pushing forward and we have to keep, keep that, that movement going. We can't just stop. We can't just say, oh my God, this is what's happening to me. This is what's happened and I'm gonna stay put. We have to move it forward and keep it going. So it is a great honor that I introduce uh, Deputy Secretary of Labor, Julie Hsu. She was appointed by President Biden and got confirmed to the Senate in 2021. Uh, prior to that, she was a Secretary of California Labor Workforce, uh, Workforce Development Agency, I'm sorry, enforcing workplace laws, combating wage theft, ensuring workplace health and safety and administrating paid family leave. I'm very excited that she's here. I'm very excited that she's part of this program and that she's here to share and fight for us. And it's gonna keep this going. So with great honor, let us welcome Deputy Secretary Julie Shu. The powerhouse. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Good morning. Buenos dias a todos. Zauan, taja hao. Buenos dias. Um, uh, thank you so much, Christina, for that kind uh, uh, introduction. Christina and I actually did a Latina Equal Pay Day event together last year. And so thank you for your story then and for your continuing inspiration and leadership now. Um, and an event like this takes a tremendous amount of behind the scenes work. And so I just really want to acknowledge our very own Department of Labor's Women's Bureau. The team is led by you. Yeah, let's give it up for the Women's Bureau. <laughs> Um, is led by uh, my friend and colleague, Wendy Chun Hoon. Um, it is really a privilege to be part of that Women Bureau, Women's Bureau sisterhood on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and thank you to our partners at the Work Institute at Cornell, Dr. Campos Medina and your team, um, and all of the speakers and participants. So welcome to the Department of Labor. Uh, we gather today in our building, which is named for Frances Perkins, the first woman to serve in the cabinet of any president in history. That by itself would have been history making, but Frances Perkins also turned out to be the most, lo the longest serving labor secretary ever, and by all accounts, the most consequential. She was the architect of a nationwide minimum wage, of social security, of unemployment insurance and restrictions on child labor. 
In short, she transformed the world for working people, not just for women, but for all workers. She is the embodiment of a theme that I want to emphasize today, that when women are given a chance, including to do work traditionally reserved for men, it's not only good for women, it's good for everyone. Right? In, in other words, equity and excellence go hand in hand. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a theme that we talk about a lot here at the Department of Labor. And the, 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 the stories, the strategies, the partnerships, the effective and life-changing work that is the subject of today's summit will leave no doubt about that. This work is not only creating opportunities for women, often in occupations that have been traditionally reserved for men, as you've already heard today, but it is uplifting entire communities. And it is reshaping our economy in exactly the way the president has told us to do, from the bottom up and the middle out. Our president has promised and he has delivered on historic investments, investments in infrastructure, in manufacturing, in climate. And as the president has said repeatedly, these are all opportunities to create good jobs in the communities that need them the most. This is not just an abstract policy goal. Those in the room know this. Infrastructure, clean energy, technological advancement, and innovation are about people. And people can only fully utilize and enjoy good roads and new bridges, electric vehicle charging station, and laptops if they are also able to enjoy the economic security that comes with a good job. People who turn on the faucet and expect clean water, people who sit down at their dining room tables to access reliable and affordable internet need to do so in homes where they can afford the rent or the mortgage and where they can afford childcare. So in order to build an economy, where no, an economy where no one is left behind, we must close the gaps caused by longstanding inequities that continue to keep black women, women of color, and all women and their families out of prosperity. For far too long, even when we have experienced prosperity, uh, we have not had equity. And now, many of the good jobs that we are creating are jobs that have excluded women. During the New Deal, the Works Progress Administration, which spanned the 30s and 40s, largely delivered on infrastructure, right? We got infrastructure and we got jobs, but we did not get equity. At that time, women made up 25% of the civilian labor force, but were only employed in 12 to 18% of the jobs that were created. Black workers and workers with disabilities were excluded from training programs and other pathways, and therefore were denied infrastructure jobs. This pattern repeated itself in the 1950s and 60s in federal highway projects and other federally funded construction projects. And the negative impacts of that were felt not by workers at that time, but through intergenerational poverty. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to learning from and not repeating that exclusionary history. As we continue our economic recovery, we know that a business as usual approach is going to leave too many workers behind. And that is why we're here today to talk about and take the collective power of women and unleash it to get it right this time, to ensure that women have good jobs, high paying quality jobs, that we end occupational segregation so women can get into whatever industries they want, and to unleash our full power to imagine a world in which the full talent, abilities, and energy of women are utilized and valued. In June, the Department of Labor had a good job summit right here in this room. And we talked then about our uh, intentional focus on using federal historic dollars to uh, create good jobs and to make sure that all workers uh, would have access to those jobs. And at that time, we highlighted things that work. Because the good news is there are things that work, and many of those examples will be talked about today. They are already in motion. They've been, you know, we never achieve things because we start them on day one, right? We start, we, 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 there's been tremendous work that builds up to the moment that we're in right now. And we know that sector-based, industry-led partnerships between labor and management that are advancing equity and job quality work, that 
through training are, you know, include wraparound services that include pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs, training programs that are intentionally inclusive, whose success is measured by how much they've advanced equity. I've been to some of these training sites, and at one, I met an African-American young woman who had not finished high school, but was about to graduate from her pre-apprenticeship program and get an apprenticeship um, laying pipes deep underground. She was one of the few women in her program, and she told me that in high school, math was an abstract thing that had no practical application. But here in her pre-apprenticeship program, she learned that right angles and fractions, things like they're not just something you like do in a book and then check the answer in the back. You actually use them in order to build things that matter to people. And in this program, for her, it all came together. And her young children, she had daughters, were about to come to her mom's graduation, the first graduation in her family, as she became a full-fledged apprentice. So imagine the impact of that, not just on her, not just on the next generation, but on all those who were, who were gonna work alongside her, right? Her instructor told me that her questions, her perspective really enhanced the education of everybody in that program. So again, excellence and equity go hand in hand. That's why the Department of Labor launched the Good Jobs Initiative. And through that initiative, we have entered into MOUs with the Departments of Transportation, Commerce, and Energy to make sure that there are good job and equity um, standards in money that goes out. And we now, so far, we've done that in over $66 billion worth of federal funds. Um, so to see more about this work, you can go to our goodjobs.gov website. But this goes far beyond what the federal government is doing and has to do. Today's Equity in Focus um, Summit recognizes that, that this kind of intentionality is gonna take the best that all of us have to give. It's gonna take federal, state, and local partnerships. It's gonna take public and private, nonprofit, philanthropy, all the folks in this room to shape how these infrastructure investments really are implemented on the ground in communities across the country and whether underserved communities actually feel them. For example, in New York City, the Department of Transportation's $102 million award to the Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market Intermodal Facility is not only gonna improve one of the largest food distribution centers in the country and create 1,000 new jobs, it is actually encompassed in our project labor agreements as well as a guarantee that 10% of the apprenticeship slots are reserved for public housing residents and 15% of the apprenticeships are reserved for women, trained through the organization Non-Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW. And NEW is also a WANTO grantee. So you all know what WANTO is, right? WANTO stands for Women in Apprenticeships and Non-Traditional Occupations. And, and it is it's three million a year, Thank you, so, and, it, and, and many of you, know, how many people are WANTO grantees, either current or, or past in the room, right? So WANTO is one of the women, Women's Bureau's signature uh, programs, and it is intended to expand pipelines to careers in non-traditional occupations like construction and manufacturing, the very jobs that we are creating to help women enter and stay in the trades and other non-traditional careers. I know about all the past and present WANTO grantees in the room today, and I'm so excited that you're gonna be here to share your stories. These are organizations led by tradeswomen who have built pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs that broke down barriers of exclusion so that women and people of color could enter these spaces. And these organizations are now taking their lessons and partnering and supporting other tradeswomen groups across the country to seize this historic moment, centering, centering race and gender equity in the work and something that I have known all my life, demonstrating that women support women. Yeah. Another example of this is the Chicago Women in Trades. Um, yes. With financial support from the Women's Bureau, who is launching a new Women in the Infrastructure Workforce initiative to provide technical assistance to 10 states. This is the kind of community capacity and accountability that helps to ensure that we deliver on equity, on job quality, and on community resilience. Women supporting women. So I talked about the importance of caregiving, and I want to say it again more explicitly here. The care sector is infrastructure. 
It is infrastructure every bit as important as our physical roads and bridges. It's infrastructure that families depend on and that our economy depends on. We have to value the work of all women, including those in jobs that are the backbone of our workforce, of our economy, and of our families. Women who work in childcare, elder care, and health care. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the tireless work you are doing. We have far more work to do. We know that. Um, our friends at the National Domestic Workers Alliance and several of the groups in this room are leading the fight for access to and affordability of care and paid time to care and increased wages and better working conditions for the care workforce. They and we know that care is the work that makes all other work possible. In fact, I know from my time in California that there are powerful grassroots networks out there winning new paid leave and paid sick days rights for workers and funding for child care and home care. So we at the Department of Labor salute your work. We support your work. You are creating the models that represent the principles that undergird the kind of care infrastructure we need as a country and that the Biden-Harris administration has been fighting for. So all of this work relies on advocates, community partners, union leaders, employers, and everyone in this room. And that's why our partnership is so important. I'm gonna close with a very quick story about I am the mother of two daughters. And there is nothing like having daughters to tell you how quickly and how soon in life the aspirations of women and girls are leveled. Um, when my older daughter, who's now grown, was five years old, she wanted to be Spider-Man for Halloween. And many people told her, women and men, children and adults, that she couldn't do that because she was a girl. At the DOL, we often talk about the superpower of the Women's Bureau. Yes. To bring people together, to lift up issues, to influence, to convene like this. And this summit is about that superpower. And it's also about the work that you all are doing in communities across the country every single day. We have a tremendous amount of work to do, right? We're gonna lift up the things that work, but we know we have so much work to do, not just in this room, but after we leave this room. And that's true in, in, in every sector of our economy. In order to make sure that women are paid equitably for our work, that women have career options that are based on, on, on interests and passions and talents and training and not on gender, that families have affordable and equitable child care and elder care, and that workers who do that care are part of the economic security and prosperity that we're building, that women are free from harassment and discrimination, you've already heard that, and retaliation, that everyone can take paid family leave and medical leave whenever they need it, and that every job is a good job with a family sustaining wage, paid sick time, a predictable schedule, and the opportunity to organize a free and independent union. So today, is about all of that work. And my call to action for all of you is this. Let's unleash our full power in this historic moment. Let's roll up our sleeves together. We know it's possible because of the women in this room and the many women who've broken down barriers who prove every single day that equity and excellence go hand in hand. We know it is possible because in real life, superheroes are women. So thank you so much for all being here, and I look forward to seeing what comes of the summit. Oh, thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Stu. Um, we do hear this every day from her. We have to unleash our full power. So are we ready to unleash our full power? Um, Keep, uh, keeping this call to action in mind, our first panel of speakers is going to do a deep dive now into how we can arrive at meeting the moment, how we can overcome occupational segregation, how we can overcome the systemic devaluation of women's work. But first, I want to do some scene setting on what occupational segregation means, its causes, and also its consequences, not just for women and our families, for all of us. One of the Women's Bureau superpowers, as the Deputy Secretary just said, is our outstanding research. And so we did what she calls us to action to do and unleashed our full power earlier this year, producing a report on this very topic of occupational segregation. It's called Bearing the Cost, How Overrepresentation in Undervalued Jobs 
disadvantaged women during the pandemic. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Sarah Jane Glynn. She's a senior advisor at the Women's Bureau who helped to author the report, and she's gonna give you some highlights. So, SJ. Hi, y'all, good morning. Um, since I have the mic, I wanna start out by telling you a story about my mama. Um, she's the best, and everything good in me came from her. Everything bad, I did myself. <laughs> and when she was young, she wanted to be an environmental engineer. And I think she would have been really good at it. But here she was, this young, intelligent, vibrant woman who had graduated high school early because she was so excited to start college. And she was told that she was not allowed to take engineering classes, not because she wasn't smart enough, not because she wasn't capable, because she was a woman. She ended up dropping out. She got married. She had four kids. One of them was me. And she spent the next 20 years working in low-paid jobs. One of them uh, that she had the longest was as a paraprofessional in our local school, um, because that meant her day ended when her kids' day ended at school. And that helped us save money on childcare. And I'm really proud to say that when she was in her 40s, she went back to college and she got a degree but it wasn't in engineering. She became a math teacher. And part of that was because teacher was a job that women were allowed to have, right? She was a great educator. She just retired. Um, and I know that she changed her students' lives, but I can't help but wonder what she would have accomplished if she'd had different opportunities available to her. And this is a different moment that we're in, right? We passed Title IX, things have changed, the world looks different, but it doesn't look that different because even now, less than a quarter of engineering degrees go to women and more than 80% of degrees in education do. Because even though things have changed dramatically in the last 50 years, we still think about education, we still think about training, we still think about jobs as gendered. My brother-in-law is a plumber and I asked him a while back if he had ever worked with a woman as a plumber. Right? He didn't know Christina, unfortunately. <laughs> and he was really shaken to tell me that in more than 20 years of working, he had never met another woman, met a woman who was a plumber. And he immediately offered to, be, uh, to take one on as an apprentice if I found a young woman. So if there's any young ladies in Nashville, Tennessee who would like to become plumbers, hit me up. But it's not surprising, right? Think if you've, if you've ever had a plumber come into your own home to fix something or maybe to your workplace, odds are that that was probably a man. Now think about all the care workers that you've ever known. Maybe somebody came in to care for an aging parent. Maybe you yourself have needed care. If you have kids, I hear that they require a lot of care, right? <laughs> and most of the people, if not every single one of those folks, was probably a woman. I did not personally have a male teacher until I was in the seventh grade. And that's because, you know, 95% of childcare workers are women, 80% of elementary and middle school teachers are women, just like my mom. So that's what we mean when we talk about occupational segregation. This is people's lives. Men and women end up being nudged, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, into particular paths. And so women are overrepresented in certain jobs and underrepresented in others. But who cares, right? Why, why does this actually matter? Obviously, it matters to individuals who don't get to do what they want, but it also matters for our economy, right? Our economy loses out on so much. There's no way for us to actually measure how much is lost when people can't do something that they would be excellent at just because of their gender, because of their race, because of their ethnicity, because of their sexual orientation, whatever the reason is, right? We're leaving so much on the table. And it makes our labor force less adaptable to changes. Look at what happened during the pandemic. That was the first time that the US economy has experienced a recession where the majority of jobs were lost by women. And that's because of occupational segregation, because women were so much more likely to be working in the industries that shed the majority of jobs. And it's also because women take on the majority of care within their families, even when they also have full-time employment outside the home. And so what did we see happen? Women's economic progress, women's labor force progress was rolled back to where it was in the 1980s. And most of that negative impact was concentrated among women of color because 
women of color were, again, vastly overrepresented in the industries that lost the most jobs, and they were underrepresented in the kinds of jobs that allowed for telework. Because we know that not all jobs are created equal, and the jobs that women are most likely to hold are very likely to pay low wages and to offer fewer benefits. And sometimes people will say, well, yes, because women choose this, as if we hate money. <laughs> but we know, right, we've seen time and time again in the data that when an occupation starts to change, as more women enter into a job and that gender balance starts to shift, as women's percentage goes up, our wages go down, right? Because we actively devalue the labor of women, and particularly of women of color. And it's not because that work isn't important, right? What did we see happen during the pandemic? When care infrastructure crumbles, the rest of the economy falls with it. We cannot work if our loved ones are not cared for. These jobs are vitally important, but we do not value them. So what does that actually mean? We, like Wendy said, you know, we released a report earlier this year. We found that even before the pandemic, so not even taking into account all of the upheavals there, black women lost 39.3 billion, with a B, dollars. And Latinas lost $46.7 billion because of occupational segregation. That's not the total cost of the gender and racial wage gaps. Those costs are significantly higher. That is just the portion that we can attribute to occupational segregation. And we know, we know what's causing this, right? Some of it is gender norms and stereotypes, which luckily have been changing over time. But educational sorting, the training gaps, women's greater caregiving responsibilities, discrimination and harassment, all of these throw up barriers that prevent women from entering into non-traditional careers in the first place and that push them out if they do make their way in. So what do we do, right? That's why we're here today. We, we need two approaches at the same time. On the one hand, we know that these women-dominated jobs, like the care sector jobs, are vitally important, but their wages are too low and they don't offer enough benefits. We have to raise the floor and increase job quality so that folks can thrive and support their families while doing that important work. And we, at the same time, we need to increase our supports so that women can enter into non-traditional careers and make sure that the jobs that are being created right now through all of these historic investments in our built infrastructure and in our environment, those jobs need to have racial and gender equity baked into them from the very beginning. And that's why I'm so heartened by the fact that the Biden-Harris administration, the Department of Labor, the Women's Bureau, every single person who's in this room right now, we're all committed to that same vision. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day and to continuing to work with you moving forward so that we can turn that vision into a reality. So this next panel is gonna talk about this in greater detail. I'm super excited for this conversation. Uh, so I wanna turn it over right now and I hope you will all join me in welcoming to the stage the Research Director for Worker Rights and Equity at the Worker Institute, Anne-Marie Brady. Hi, everyone. This is really fantastic um, to be here today, and thank you so much for coming. For our first panel, we have an illustrious group of women to introduce, and I'm very excited to start with uh, Riza Lieberitz, Professor of Labor and Employment Law at the ILR School and the Academic Director for the Cornell University Worker Institute. Um, we're joined by Leah Rambo, who is Director of Training for Smart Local 28. <laughs> Ariana Hegovich is a senior research fellow for the Institute for Women's Policy Research. And Anna Wadia is the executive director for Care for All with Respect and Equity Care Fund. So to get us started today, the 
We should, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. To get us started today, the panel will set the framing and theoretical foundations for the day. So the key themes that we're going to pull out throughout the various uh, panels and breakout rooms, just breakout sessions. But um, I'd like to start off with uh, Riza Liberowitz, who will um, address the, the issue of gender and racial disparities from a legal perspective. Um, hearing what SJ laid out for us, how do we address gender and racial disparities to create a more equitable workforce? Well, good morning. It's so great to be here. It's inspiring uh, to see everybody. It's inspiring to hear everybody that we've heard from. And I'm so honored to have the chance to talk at this point in this process. Uh, listening to um, uh, Sarah Jane Lynn was, was terrific in terms of setting out some of the issues. And what I'd like to address in, um, in my remarks now is to think about framing issues. Now, I, my area is law, but you're not going to be treated to a long discussion of legal doctrine here. Uh, my area is thinking about law in its social framework and how do we frame the issues and the goals that we're trying to seek so that we can accomplish the, the kinds of equity uh, goals and, and practices that we have in mind. So I want to start with this idea of what are the possible frameworks that we can use to consider how to achieve a more equitable workforce. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is the kind of the dominant main framework that we see in law and social policy in the US. And that's a framework for addressing gender and racial disparities in employment through an anti-discrimination approach. And that anti-discrimination approach is towards what's been called formal equality. So that's the first framework that I'm going to look at. And so formal equality is a framework that focuses on creating law and public policy aimed at eliminating discrimination against, and I'm going to put this in quotes, uh, similarly situated groups. So for example, under a formal equality framework, men and women with similar qualifications should be hired for a job without regard to under a formal equality framework. Men and women with similar qualifications should be hired for a job without regard to their sex or their gender. And this formal equality approach can be used to prohibit discrimination in this way with regard to individuals being compared to each other when they apply for a job, for example. Or it could also be used to think about prohibiting discrimination against groups where you see a pattern or practice of discrimination against groups um, depending on gender, race, uh, national origin, uh, disability, the kinds of pr protected categories that we think about under law. Now, that kind of approach, that formal equality approach, has made progress. And it's made progress toward expanding employment opportunities to groups who have been historically excluded from jobs and occupations based on gender, race, national origin, religion, and disability. And so this is, as I say, progress, and it matters. Um, but it's also true that formal equality is necessary, but it's not sufficient to achieve equity. Formal equality assumes that individuals with the same qualifications are similarly situated. However, this is often a false assumption. For example, men and women with the same qualifications are usually not similarly situated because of systemic inequalities that affect them differently. And one clear example is one that has been discussed already today and that uh, we all know about, which is the example of systemic inequality where we have disproportionate responsibility placed on women to engage in childcare and other kind of care work. And this systemic inequality for oftentimes unpaid work places women at a disadvantage 
in terms of moving into occupations with work requirements that do not account for their care duties outside of work. We also have other disproportionate impacts based on systemic inequalities. The example, <clears throat> excuse me, that SJ talked about with regard to the disproportionate impact of COVID on women and people of color is another example. And so we're not similarly situated because we live in an unequal society where that baked in status quo of inequality affects us. Um, so formal equality will just go so far. It's necessary to open the door to inclusion through formal equality to a range of occupations, but it's not sufficient to use formal equality to make fundamental change the sort of systemic change that's needed to address those inequalities in the distribution of power and privilege in the United States. So what do we need? Well, we need a different framework, and that is progress beyond building on this notion of formal equality toward achieving what's called substantive equality. And that is equality that is defined in terms of inclusion in ways that fit the realities of people's lives. And using this reality-based goal of substantive equality works towards inclusion of all groups in all occupations. And that enables us to have all of us to have a meaningful and satisfying life at work, at home, and in our communities. So it's that idea of expanding our opportunities to move into different occupations and lifting all occupations towards a substantively equal existence. And that's a fitting framework for our discussion today. It's certainly a fitting framework for the Women's Bureau and the Worker Institute's work together in this equity and focus project as we've discussed in the three prior webinars over the past year and at this summit uh, that we're embarking on today. And through that substantive equality framework, we can envision public policy, law, and practice through an equity lens to make fundamental systemic change. This entails dismantling systemic inequalities, including those based on gender and race and the barriers that have been put up to actual equality in society and in the workplace more specifically. And it means adopting policies and practices that expand meaningful inclusion and retention of all groups in all kinds of occupations. Now, I'm just going to uh, mention a few ways as examples of advancing substantive equality that involve government role in at the federal level, the state level, the local level to adopt and enforce law and public policy that make progress towards substantive equality. Um, and many of these are described in the excellent uh, Department of Labor's report bearing the costs that you heard discussed today. Uh, that includes legislative reforms to strengthen anti-discrimination law to address systemic inequalities. But we need more than anti-discrimination law. We need positive programs. We need laws and public policies and programs to provide support to fulfill basic needs and to think of the universal, that we all need health care, universal health care, universally accessible child care, elder care, free public education at all levels, paid individual family leave, all of the kinds of things that we can think about listing. And those will create the social and economic conditions to enable all groups to participate more equally in the workplace. And we need strong support for employee rights to unionize for the collective interests of labor. We, yeah. <laughs> and strong unions have long supported these kinds of legal change and social and public programs towards substantive equality, all the universals that we can think about. And through collective bargaining, unions can build on those 
legal foundations to move even more effectively towards substantive equality in the workplace. All the programs that you've heard about discussed today and that we'll talk about more like apprenticeship programs, additional childcare benefits and subsidies, flexible work schedules, et cetera, et cetera, all the things we know about. So I hope that framing this issue has been helpful and will be helpful in our discussions today. And I thank you for your attention and I look forward to hearing uh, all the more inspiring ideas to come. Thank you so much, Riza. Ariana, how do we translate the universal into the reality? So you recently re released a national report on women's experiences in the trades. What does your research tell us about women's experiences in the trades? Well, thank you so much um, for this question and for being on this panel for those who organized it. Um, as you said at the outset, I work at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and we are a think tank here in DC focused on gender and racial equity and on the economic security of women and their families. And that's why we have been working, or I have been working for all my life on um, those two issues of women's underrepresentation in good um, technical and trade jobs and their overrepresentation in poorly paid care jobs. And being at an event like this, which not only recognizes the um, connection between these two, but it's also committed and expert at changing it is, is, is a really career highlight. So um, I am also, by the way, a member of the National Task Force on Tradeswomen's Issues, which is a small and mighty group of volunteer tradeswomen and allies trying to make sure that the issues for tradeswomen are up on the agenda and that we have policy solutions that people can turn to. I'm also a facts and figures person, so everything I'm going to say you can find on our website, www.iwpr. I was so impressed with SJ. I've read her report. She only had two very important figures. You get a few more percentages from me, but I'm trying to keep it down. <laughs> um, so um, as Anne-Marie said, um, we recently completed uh, the largest survey ever of women working in the trades on the tools, like electricians and plumbers and carpenters. And the survey was done at the beginning of last year with the help of the Kellogg Foundation. And we wanted to focus particularly on the issues of retention and advancement, because a lot of good initiatives are there to get more women into the trades and apprenticeship. So this is the complement what happens when they do get in. Let me share, um, start with the positive. Um, and it's very exciting at the moment to work on tradeswomen's issues because last year we had the highest number of tradeswomen ever working in the trades, over 300,000. Um, this is twice as many. If you think of a very traditional occupation for women, dental hygienists or female dominated now veterinarians. It's you put those two together and there are more women working on the trades. Um, so the second good reason since 2016, um, the number of tradeswomen has grown by almost 100,000. Uh, and there's been double digit growth in women in apprenticeships across race and ethnicity. This is a very diverse workforce, and it's a workforce that is on a roll. Um, first result from our survey, which actually, you know, I, we didn't know and I didn't quite expect. Um, over 60% of women who replied, and it, you know, it was 2,600 women in the trades who did reply, very large survey from all states, um, are mothers. Um, over almost a quarter have kids under six, which actually is about the same as in the female workforce overall. Um, and um, the reason we think it's so important when we talk to contractors, when we talk to people, they always say, oh, it's so hard to recruit women because there's no childcare. Childcare is a problem, right? 
construction hours are a problem. But think of nursing. When do nurses work? Same kind of difficult hours. And there are lots of women doing nursing. So just saying. Um, anyways. Um, now, however, here's the however. We know that women are vastly underrepresented in these good jobs, and fewer than one in 20 women, uh, fewer than one in 20 workers in the trades are women. So why is that? Um, first reason is related to finding out about it. Just about 6% of the women who answered our survey said they were ever told about opportunities in the trades by their high school counselors. And that is not higher for apprentices or young women, right? So it's a real issue. In, in fact, most of the women we talk to, or not most, but maybe half of the women I talk to who are tradeswomen have a degree because they first went to college then they came out of college, then they found they couldn't find a job that paid enough for the college debt. And then they were lucky enough to chance upon um, apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship program and somehow got into the trades and were able to earn a good living. So we need to work on that outreach. The second issue is many women, when they get into the trades, have a good experience. However, um, for between a quarter and a third of the women, sexual harassment, uh, not quarter and a third, a fifth and a quarter. <laughs> so uh, a substantial minority. Um, sexual harassment, harassment because of their gender, their race, their sexual orientation is frequently or always part of their um, job experience. That is very high. Um, and it's among the highest occupations and, um, that you can find this level of harassment. Secondly, a similar, um, around similar numbers say that, again, not sometimes, but frequently or always, they're faced with discrimination in hiring. And you know, in construction, there's, con you know, you're hired and laid off constantly because of the way contracts are organized. So in hiring, in layoffs, in access to overtime, in access to the best work opportunities, the opportunity to build your skills, even which I, is very shocking, almost 30% said that it's, they, they're not, it's frequently or rare that they're giving the safety equipment, the gloves they need to work in the right sizes or the harnesses. Um, and last not least, a, almost half of them say they are frequently always held to higher standards than men, right? And this is an industry where it's very physical work. It wears on you physically. You may not ask for help. It's a health and safety issue as well as a mental health issue. So maybe, maybe not surprisingly, almost half of the women who answered the survey said in the last five years they had seriously considered leaving the trades. Now we ask women who are still in the trades, right? Because it's hard to get um, <laughs> those who left. But this is, this again, Turning back to nurses, we know nurses recently, there's been a lot of discussion about nurse, nurses wanting to leave the nursing occupation, um, not just find another job, but leave their, their field altogether. And this is about the same level as nurses. It's very high, it's very expensive to the industry because there's a high level of investment in getting people to be skilled. And also, of course, if you can't find skilled workers, it's a very high cost um, for the industry in terms of not being able to do the contracts or complete them on time or do them more poorly. Um, why do they say they are, um, they are thinking about leaving or some of them have left? Um, the most commonly cited reason as very important is um, discrimination and lack of respect, and issues such as a yelling culture, or I raised something, uh, raised an issue, and the issue wasn't taken seriously. Childcare also is an issue, but 
it's down to about number eight or so for about a third of the reason, um, third of, of respondents. And I do not want to belittle childcare, but again, childcare isn't everything. Um, and I think, you know, turning back to the positive, discrimination, harassment, lack of respect, not following through on um, complaints that are raised, these are fixable issues. And in this audience, we have people who have fixed them. There are lots of welcoming work sites in the construction site. There are women who say what makes them succeed are the implementation of the, these policies, are the support um, from their male um, co-workers, from their union locals. We know that this change is possible. We know even that, um, or, you know, we're working together on the issue of childcare. Um, I've just heard about the first company from, actually from Mississippi, who in construction, who work nine to three um, shifts. It change is possible. So once again, thanks again for, thank you so much for caring about this issue and being at this event. And um, back to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much, Ariane. Leah Rambo, as director of training for Smart Local 28, how do we translate these findings and put them into practice? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I got an answer for it. But before I, uh, I start with that answer, I just want to say, um, first and foremost, that I am a proud sheet metal worker. Um, and that, that I've been in the, the trade 34 years, and it's, it's hard to imagine it's that long. And for my uh, other trade sisters in the audience, I also want to say that uh, sheet metal workers are better than all the other trades. <laughs> so <laughs> we just want to start, uh, start with that. <laughs> but, I, um, you know, we've done a lot of things in, in my industry, either locally or even um, with my international, to try to improve the, the situation of, of women on the job, trades women on the job. But I, I do want to start off with a little story. It's, um, it's serious. It's not a happy story, even though I have a lot of happy stats to share with you. This one's not. And this just happened this week. Uh, my school is in the process of building a new school. I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's been years in the planning. And I decided to just take a little um, tour of the job. I said, I'm going to walk the job. I was dressed in pretty much clothes like this, uh, with work boots on. I threw on a hard hat, and I had on a safety vest. And I'm taking pictures um, just to update, you know, our construction meeting. And um, I'm watching a, a couple of uh, men. They're putting on the, the decking on the job. And I'm just taking pictures. And one of them um, gives me the middle finger, both middle fingers. Just, just that was his greeting. And, um, you know, like many of my, my trade sisters, um, my initial, my culture, I've been trained to just ignore that. I was just thinking, this idiot. And my, my, my response to him was like, nice. Well, I guess that response wasn't good enough. There wasn't a big enough reaction. So then he gave it to me again, but this time he grabbed his crotch. And um, so I took a picture of him. <laughs> and I finished taking my pictures. I went over to the office, uh, the GC's office, very respectable general contractor, explained what happened. I showed him the picture with the crotch shot, right, because I'd ignored the first one. And uh, the project manager says, well, did you get a picture of the, the first one with him putting his middle finger up? And I'm like, no. And I'm thinking, why would I need that? This, this one is not, you know, sufficient um, uh, evidence here that this is bad behavior. And he's like, oh, this is unacceptable. I'm like, yeah, I agree. So I left. Uh, about 10 minutes later, he gives me a call. He says, oh, yeah, he told me his name. Uh, he was an iron worker. He could have been any trade, but this one happened to be an iron worker. And he says, uh, he wants to talk to you. I said, really? I said, well, I'm on the other line, so I won't be able to speak to him. And I hung up and continued what I was doing. The hour passed, and then I get um, a text. OK, this is unacceptable. He's off the job. I said, great. I said, send me the name of the company and his last name. So I got the name of the company, but I never got the guy's last name. 
And this is about three or four days now. Each morning, I send a little text. Uh, can you send me his last name? I haven't received it yet. So it's really um, just a little story. Now, I'm in these type of clothes, so clearly I wasn't working on the job that day. If you're in the trades, you would imagine I'm probably the project manager, an owner of one of the other trades, maybe an engineer. And he felt very, very comfortable. That was his greeting to me. So in my head, I'm saying to myself, well, what's going to happen when my sisters get on this job? What's going to happen when my first year apprentice gets on this job? If that was his greeting to me, um, what's it going to be for them? So, you know, I say that to, term, to talk really about, um, I guess, part of my motivation, you know, in this, in this field. Because I've experienced so many things. And, and believe me, to some of you, it might be shocking, as it is to um, many of my friends or even my sister when I told her about this incident. Uh, but for as a tradeswoman, this was considered like a very mild. This was mild. My sisters out there know that this was like, you know, we just would brush that off. Um, and so there's a culture, there's a real culture that needs to be changed. And I think a lot of the, the efforts that we're doing within locally or internationally is really about, you know, changing those cultures um, and eliminating some of those barriers. Because that would be like a type of barrier that would keep someone from staying, right? You're in there, you're happy, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, first day on the job, and this is what you're, you know, what you're hit with. So I just wanted to share that real-life experience that happened this week. This week, it happened on Monday. Um, and um, of course, this guy didn't know that I was the one representing the owner on this particular job. Um, but, but that's what happened to me this week. So, but I will tell you some happy news. I don't want you to go home depressed. Um, you know, when, it, when we're talking about addressing some of these um, barriers, I think one of the barriers we deal with is that women simply don't know these jobs exist. They don't know about them. And then when they find out about them, they certainly don't think about it, that it's for them. So, you know, some of the things that we do in terms of making sure women know that it exists has to do with our promoting, how we promote um, our trade. You know, we, we send it to everyone. Well, we, we look in the papers, we send it out community, we're on social media, and we target areas where we know they're gonna women, their women are gonna be. Um, so there's been campaigns for recruitment where we've targeted colleges and specifically sports teams and colleges. There's been campaigns where we've targeted gyms, specifically gyms that women um, go to or all women gyms. So it's those type of areas. And we also really rely very heavily on the people within the trade. So when I'm talking to the apprentices or, or journey workers, I say, hey, you think your mother would do this? Do you think your sister could do this? Do you think your wife could do this? Do you think your partner could do this? How about your daughter? And so we're specifically like trying to like just trigger in these, um, the men that I work with to bring people in, bring women into the trades. And I, you know, we frame it in such a way to say, why don't you work with her? You train her. Well, now she has instant protection, right? Instant, um, you know, she got muscle behind her when, when big brother or, or dad's bringing it in. So some of that is how we do it. On our application a few years back, someone told me, um, Leah, you don't have anything that says women are encouraged to apply. It took two seconds to change that on our, you know, in our application. It increased the number of women that came. Just that simple sentence. Just when I say, you know, um, people of color or minorities, veterans, and I just added women. I was ashamed that I didn't think of that on my own, but I didn't. Um, women are encouraged to apply was another thing that we did really to just promote it. And I'd say another uh, huge thing that we do in terms of our recruitment process is we have a, a pretty blind process in that we do recruitment for a month. So we don't have one day where you have to stay overnight and camp out. Um, I mean, goodness, what do you do? What do you do if you have to go to the bathroom? You know, let's be real. What do you do if you're, if you're on your cycle? How do you stay on that line all night? If you have children, what do you do? So we made our, our process for one month, right? We have hours throughout the day. For one solid month, there's no first come, there's no first, you know, first come, first serve. At the end of the month, if you fill out the application properly, and about half do not, then you go into our lottery. Once you're in our lottery, it's just a touch of the button. The lowest number is the one who comes in to take the test. And that's how we do our recruitment. So it takes out the, um, just the natural inclination for us to think about what does a construction work look like? Who will be able to do that? 
And I've gotten some women that have come in about five feet tall. I can tell you there's one in particular I'm thinking of in the audience who's even shorter than five foot, um, who's in the trade for many years, but um, petite women who are able to, to do the job, do the, the equipment. And that just kind of wipes out that whole stereotype that women have and men have. It's just what we're conditioned um, to stop people from coming in the trade. Now, we do use many um, direct entry programs. These are programs that are doing some training. A lot of them, are. Uh, we have one in particular um, that we use, non-traditional employment for women. And I know, I know that they're here. Uh, we do rely on them heavily. They work very closely with the building trades, um, and they will get direct entry. But we also do direct entry with other programs, like Opportunities Long Island, to cover areas that we have a hard time finding workers, or um, CTE, which is a career and technical education high school. So we go directly to those schools, and if they graduate in a program that's related to construction, trades, math, science, computers, anyway, then they can get direct entry into our program. And also, of course, programs like Construction Skills and Helms to Hard Hats. So we go out of our way to look for programs, um, direct entry programs, that we know coming in, they're going to have a, a diverse population. So that's some of the things that we, that we do right off the bat to try to um, even out, I guess, areas where uh, women might not come in. And, and I'll say the, one of the last things that we do in terms of that is that um, once a person uh, gets into the program, uh, we use a system that's really just about numbers. So we have a math test. That's what we do. We have a math test. If you get a certain score on the math test, that's good enough. You come in. The rest will train you. The rest will teach you. The type of things they get you out of the program, you don't show up to work. You're late. Those are the type of things. So that, I think that fear process has a real impact on the amount of people that come, uh, that come in. And we use gender-neutral uh, language in all of, our, all of our materials. Now, when it comes to uh, another barrier, we talked about harassment. We talked about child care, and um, you know we make sure that everyone has training on harassment. The instructors, our union officials, our shop stewards, everyone across the board has to have this, um, this training. And we also offer it to all of our contractors so that when there are incidents on the job, then they're in a position um, where they can have the training that they need for their, worker, for their workers. Our international local, um, international union, SMART, which is the air rail transportation workers, there are several initiatives that have been put in place. Uh, recently, the general president um, uh, started a council, recruitment and retention council, which is specifically designed to increase the number of women and minorities. Uh, we have a campaign called I Got Your Back. And it's simply simple, it's a sticker. If a woman gives this to a sticker to a person, it, they put it on their hard hat and it recognizes them across. It's a, just a visual sign that this is a person you can go to if there's an issue on the job or trouble. So it's very simple, but it's a real visual sign on how to spot that person on the job um, who's going to be an ally. And then one of the biggest initiatives internationally is uh, one called Be For All. And Be For All is a collaborative initiative between um, Smart International, the ITI, which is the training arm for the sheet metal workers, and SMACNA, which is the Contractors Association, which specifically is looking to change our culture. How do we change our culture? How do we remove bullying, hazing, and harassing? Now, we've already put it in our Constitution to make that a chargeable offense. We did that at our last uh, Constitution. But now, it's in there. And as many of you know who work for the government, I mean, there's laws, and then now how do we enforce it, right? How to, and, so, and so we're at that part. We're, we're at that stage. So those are um, just some of the things that, um, that we're doing right now. Okay. Thank you so much, Leah. When we think about infrastructure, we think about the building trades, and then we also think about the care economy, two sources of infrastructure. Anna, uh, I'd love to hear from you from the perspective of philanthropy, how we address inequities in the care economy and how excuse me, how does addressing equities, inequities in the care economy help overcome occupational segregation and the systemic devaluing of women's work? And what is philanthropy's role? 
Well, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And um, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be here and see all of you in the room. I also want to thank Wendy Chen Hoon and the Women's Bureau to bring us together to really think deeply about equity and equity and implementation, which is so important. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Great. My name is Anna Wadia, and I am the executive director of the Care for All with Respect and Equity Fund, or the CARE Fund. The CARE Fund is a uh, collaborative fund that brings together a diverse range of foundations with the aim of investing $50 million over five years in movement building for a universal, publicly supported care infrastructure. We take a holistic approach to care and caregiving across the life cycle and across generations. This means policies and programs that improve the livelihoods of paid and unpaid caregivers and the quality of care for all who need it. So why have so many foundations come together to, and decided that this is the moment to invest in a holistic approach to the care economy? You know, I like to say that the pandemic ripped the invisibility cloak off of some really deep truths about care that had just been hidden in plain sight for so long. First, care is at the crux of systems of oppression by gender, race, age, ability, immigration status, and family structure. In our economy and society, we grossly devalue everyone who provides care, and also everyone who needs care. And so winning robust care systems and supports can be a linchpin to unravel these legacies of oppression. The other thing that became so clear in the pandemic is that care is not only essential to thriving families, but it is also fundamental to a thriving and equitable economy. Sitting here in the Labor Department, I think I can say that investing in the care economy impacts both the supply and the demand for labor in dynamic and reinforcing ways. The professionals who provide essential care, education, and personal support to children, to older adults, and to people with disabilities, they are among the lowest compensated workers in our economy. Due to the occupational segregation that SJ talked about, they're predominantly women and disproportionately women of color and immigrants who barely make minimum wages and rarely receive benefits. At the same time, most workers, all the rest of us, are also caregivers or need care to thrive in our workplaces and communities. And because in our society, women take on the majority of care responsibilities, inadequate childcare, no paid leave, barely um, any funding for long-term services and supports, this all hinders women's ability to get jobs, to stay in jobs, to move up career ladders, and actually to accumulate assets for financial security and retirement. So we have a situation where Families can't afford the care they need. And at the same time, the women, predominantly women of color, who work in care receive poverty wages. So to address this affordability gap, and at the same time to fuel our economy, we need massive public investment in care infrastructure. So that brings me back to the CARE Fund and our theory of change. We believe that we need to resource all the movements for care and also support them to come together to build and aggregate their power because we have to generate political will for bold public investments, investments that meet the needs of workers, of families, and of care consumers. So that's why we've been supporting movement building networks, some of which you'll hear from in the next panel, and coalition tables to advocate for care at the federal and state level. Moving forward, 
We'll continue to support this movement in power building, as well as narrative and culture change and policy innovation, and most relevant to today's meeting, implementation for equity. So as one example, the American Rescue Plan includes historic investments in care, actually almost 40 billion for child care and almost 13 billion for home and community-based services. And also billions that states and localities have the discretion to use for paid leave and other family-friendly policies. And as we've been discussing today, there are of course many other streams of federal money going to states, localities, and tribes. So there is a huge opportunity to use these funds strategically to deliver equity. What does equitable implementation though actually mean when it comes to care policies and programs? First, no matter what the policy, it is essential that all stakeholders are at the table as plans are designed and implemented. So this means care workers, parents and other family caregivers, older adults, and people with disabilities. Second, whether we're talking about child care or home care, given occupational segregation, equity has to mean dedicating funds to improving care jobs. Almost all states are using American Rescue Plan dollars to improve home care worker compensation, and over half the states are increasing compensation for child care workers. But unfortunately, given the time-limited nature of those funds, many of these um, compensation increases are like one-time bonuses or temporary increases. Third, across sectors, training opportunities have the potential to improve the quality of jobs and the quality of care. But it's essential that to be equitable, these training opportunities need to be affordable and accessible to the predominantly women of color incumbent workers because otherwise they risk being displaced. There are also many ways to bake equity into specific care programs and policies. In childcare, We've, as we've heard from other panelists, women in construction, as well as in more traditional sectors like nursing, retail, and hospitality, they need childcare at all hours because of their volatile work schedules. Equity also means targeting funds to historically underinvested communities and coordinating programs such as childcare, home visiting, mental health, and early intervention services to effectively serve families with complex needs. As states use federal dollars to invest in home and community-based services, they have many opportunities to expand eligibility and make it easier for consumers to apply for benefits. And for years, paid leave advocates have been learning what it takes to make programs equitable, including progressive wage replacement, broad family definitions, and culturally appropriate outreach and education with trusted messengers. So given the incredible opportunity presented by the American Rescue Plan and the other federal streams we're discussing today. Many of the movement building groups we've been funding, like Caring Across Generations, Family Values at Work, and the National Domestic Workers Alliance, are deeply engaged in making sure these policies are implemented equitably. And we'll soon be announcing an additional set of grants to organizations that are providing technical assistance to state and tribal administrators to help them in implement these funds in equitable ways. And equally importantly, many of these grantees will also be providing re-grants to local advocates to hold their state and tribal administrators accountable, and also to document and tell the stories of impact because what we have to do is we have to make these temporary um, dollars, we have to make them permanent and long-term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. So we're at time. I just want to thank Riza, Ariane, Anna, and uh, Leah for, for really great insights into the issues that we'll be discussing in more depth throughout the day. And uh, yeah, off we go. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm Gail Golden with the Women's Bureau, and it is so wonderful to be with you here today. Thank you again to that incredible panel. So thought-provoking, really appreciate it. And uh, I know we have so much more inspiring conversation ahead of us. So it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, to the Department of Labor's Chief Economist, Joelle Gamble. She's an expert on consumer finance issues, including student and medical debt, retirement policy, and labor issues. And she comes to us from as a special assistant to the president for the economic policy, <clears throat> special assistant to the president for economic policy for the Biden-Harris White House National Economic Council. So happy to have Joelle here today to share some comments with you. Joelle. Thank you, Gail. Thank you to the Women's Bureau. Always, always holding it down. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you to the Cornell ILR Worker Institute for this great, great gathering. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and so I will be brief because you've got a lot of great experts um, who are speaking to you today about these issues. I just wanted to be clear about the fact that, you know, as we all know, there is a strong economic case um, for the, a lot of the work that the, the folks here today are talking about for gender equity in the economy. And so I will just add my inflation adjusted two cents. That's just, <laughs> well, also, you know, not to be glib, like we really do need to see real wage increases. Um, and so by traditional, you know, measures in economics, you know, we should be improving gender equity in access to work and the quality of work and access to work in different sectors of the economy, as the panel on trades talked about, um, and also, you know, investing in a lot of the sectors in the economy that have been long underinvested in, like care, as the next panel will talk about. Um, and expanding gender equity, expanding opportunity is important by some of these traditional measures, in part for a few reasons. One, you know, innovation comes from when everyone who has the potential to invent, to innovate, is given the opportunity to. There's a lot of research showing just how important, you know, bringing in different voices, bringing in people who have been left out of those spaces are to improving innovation, which is good for growth. It's important for productivity because workers having a choice in the labor market, being able to go into jobs that they want to go in, that they can excel in, is important for improving overall productivity. And we know that discrimination and bias in the workplace can often actually you know, hinder outcomes in the workplace, and that's also not a good thing for productivity. And then ultimately, economic growth. So systemic inequity means that women are not able to fully contribute to the economy in the way that they want to. And I, I want to emphasize that want to is important. It's about choice here, right? Um, and then that means that certain types of work are not counted, even though they are valuable and we don't invest in it like care. According to a McKinsey Global Institute study, you know, gender equity and gender parity, in fact, um, in the US would have grown GDP by $4.3 trillion over a 10-year period. So when I say the traditional measures of, of economic growth are in favor of gender parity, gender equity, um, I, I'm not kidding. That's a lot of lost potential in the US economy. And that's not just for more women participating in the workforce in the same amount as men, but also across sectors, right? But that's, you know, a lot of the traditional stuff that we talk about. But what also matters in how we think about the economy is how people feel about the economy, right? So valuing the work of women, especially care work, is important to improving our living standards every day. It's not just a statistic, right? It's about knowing that your loved one, for example, is cared for without breaking the bank. It means, you know, for a care worker, for example, focusing on the care that you provide without having to worry about pay or scheduling issues. Essentially, I'm talking about dignity. And so we can talk about all those statistics all we want, but we also care about dignity, people's everyday lives. Um, and at DOL, we understand the importance of rebalancing power in the labor market, especially when it comes to our support for workers' rights to organize, to form a union, um, in order to improve gender and racial equity in the economy and improve that dignity and quality of life that we all care so much about. So I'm really looking forward to the next section as we dig into some of those aspects, including around the care economy, um, which leads me to introduce our, our next speaker, who I think will lead the next panel, Julie Cashin. Julie is the director of the Women's Economic and Justice work at the Century Foundation, where she is also a senior fellow. She brings more than two decades of experience in childcare and pre-K, work in family, economic mobility, and labor issues. So welcome, Julie. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Julie Cashin. It's so nice to be with you all. So take a moment to think about who you care for and who cares for you. At some point, every one of us will need care or need to provide care. But as Joelle and Anawadia and others have already said, for too long, we've left families shouldering the responsibilities of caregiving and working, taking double and triple shifts without common sense solutions like paid family and medical leave, paid sick days, affordable high quality child care, and home and community based services. As sociologist Jessica Calerco wrote, other countries have safety nets, the United States has women. We need a publicly funded system that recognizes care as both an individual and social responsibility, that values and better compensates care workers, and supports family members to both care and provide financially for each other. And it's not just common sense, it's a policy win for all. It's good for the economy, it's good for families, it's good for communities, it's good for the people who need the care, it's good for the people who provide the care. It is good for everyone, and it is the pathway to gender and racial equity, which is why some in power are fighting so hard against it. But luckily, there's a lot of forces for good who are powerful and fighting for it, and many of them are sitting next to me right now. So I'm very happy to be joined by Leslie Frain, Executive Vice President at SEIU. You want to raise your hand? <laughs> hey Young Yoon, Senior Policy Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Sarah Jimenez, a Senior Researcher with Community Labor United and Lead Organizer, <laughs> who brought her fan club for the Care That Works Coalition. Martine Gordon, Senior Advisor for Early Childhood Development at the Administration for Children and Families, and Ingrid Mesquita, Director of the San Francisco Department of Early Childhood. Powerful group right here. So let's start with you, Leslie. SEIU organizes both child care and home care workers. Can you talk a little bit about the job quality for those workers before you organize them, and what you're fighting for, and what equity would look like? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and I wanna start by thanking you for facilitating this discussion and thanks to the Department of Labor Women's Bureau for hosting us today. Um, as Julie said, I'm Leslie Frayne, Executive Vice President of the Service Employees International Union, and I'm really proud to be here on behalf of two million service and care workers in SEIU in the fight for 15 in a union. And I'm especially thrilled to be here joining this panel of amazing women all of whom have worked tirelessly to champion the rights of care workers. And we all do this work because we know that the care economy makes all other work possible. Care workers keep our kids safe when we go to work. They support people with disabilities so they can live independently at home. They allow seniors to age with dignity in the setting of their choice. But shamefully, although the majority women of color care workforce provides for those we love most, we pay them the least. The average home care worker in the US earns less than $15 an hour and less than $22,000 a year. 40% of home care workers live below the poverty line and 43% depend on public assistance to meet their basic needs. It's not right and it's not sustainable. And that really takes us back to your question, Julie. And the question I would, I would pose is how can we transform care jobs into good jobs? which I would argue starts with giving essential care workers a voice on the job through a union. Because when workers come together and act collectively, real change is possible. Just to give some examples, earlier this month, 2,000 nursing home workers in Pennsylvania went on strike for a week. And as a direct result, they won wage increases, safe staffing commitments, more affordable health care, and more. In Nevada earlier this year, union home care workers fought for and won legislation that created an innovative state standards board. And that board is empowered to investigate uh, working conditions in the home care sector. Workers will have a seat at the table to, along with other stakeholders, make recommendations about wages, health care, sick days, training, and explicitly they're tasked with recommendations about how to address racism and gender-based discrimination. 
Uh, but for me, the best way to understand how unions transform home care jobs into good jobs is through the story of Seattle home care worker and SEIU member, Brittany Williams, and her mom, Danielle. Brittany is a third generation home care worker. And as a result of hard work by Brittany, her coworkers, and her union, Washington home care workers now start at $17.11 an hour. They have paid leave, they have affordable health care, they have a retirement plan, and they have guaranteed raises every six months. But Brittany is painfully aware that her mom, Danielle, who is a home care worker in Arkansas, works seven days a week and is paid almost exactly half of Brittany's wages. Danielle earns just $9 an hour. Why are Danielle and Brittany's stories so different? Well, it's pretty simple. Brittany's part of a union and Danielle is not. Now, Danielle would join a union in a minute if she could, but the laws that purport to give workers the right to join unions are so broken that for practical purposes, workers, especially workers in red states, can't organize at all. It's worth reminding ourselves that domestic workers, like agricultural workers, were explicitly excluded from New Deal era labor laws because Southern Democrats were clear that they wouldn't vote for those laws if they covered these predominantly black workforces. Many home care workers are still treated as independent contractors or as quasi-public employees, which means they're excluded from all federal labor rights and only have rights if individual states pass uh, special laws covering them. And as you can imagine, some states do that and many states do not. And while home care workers who work for private agencies are technically covered by the National Labor Relations Act, they have to contend with anti-union employer conduct, which for practical purposes precludes unionization for most of them. We need to unrig the rules so that all care providers, regardless of the color of their skin or where they live, have the right to join unions and win the kinds of conditions that Brittany Williams and her coworkers currently enjoy. But we also need a robust federal investment in home care to transform jobs and to meet the deepening care crisis in this country. By 2028, we will need to fill an estimated 4.7 million home care jobs. And as we all know, our population is aging. 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day, and the clock is ticking. The longer we delay in investing in our care economy, the more workers leave their jobs because frankly, they simply can't afford to stay in the sector. Earlier this year, Congress passed an important investment in physical infrastructure, which created good jobs for construction workers across the country. They also debated an unprecedented investment in long-term care. But as I think we all know, that investment was carved out of the bill that ultimately became the Inflation Reduction Act. To be clear, SEIU supported the Infrastructure Act. It was a necessary and very important piece of legislation. But I confess that we can't help asking a really painful question. Is it a coincidence that Congress passed the law that funded good physical infrastructure jobs that are mostly filled by men while the investment in life-sustaining care jobs done mostly by women of color got left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> With the nationwide care crisis working, worsening, the need to act has never been more urgent. And that's why SEIU members and our many allies and partners, some of whom are represented on this panel, won't back down in our demands for a major investment in home and community-based care. That will take dollars, but it will also take policy changes. Medicaid funding should be made contingent on states establishing a process to set fair wage and benefit rates for workers. And that process must include a direct voice for the workers who provide the care every day. States should be required to provide training for home care workers, which will enhance both care and job quality. And the federal government should demand that employers who receive Medicaid dollars provide workers with a real path to joining a union. The 800,000 home care workers in SEIU will continue to organize and to fight until every home care worker in this country has family sustaining wages, paid sick leave, and a union. We'll keep marching in the streets for an equitable future and a voice in our democracy. Inaction is really not an option because seniors, people with disabilities, working families, and our communities deserve nothing less.
Thank you, Leslie. Brittany and Danielle's story is such a compelling vision of the union difference that it could make. And I think a lot of folks have an answer to your question about whether it was a coincidence that Congress passed jobs that will mostly go to men and left women of color behind. Was it a coincidence? Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to Hey Young. Uh, hey Young, the National Domestic Workers Alliance organizes home care workers, nannies, and house cleaners for respect, recognition, and earning their rights. You've had a lot of successes in states with domestic workers' bills of rights, and we're part of the successful fight that Leslie mentioned for COVID relief funding for HCBS for Home and Community-Based Services and the American Rescue Plan. So can you talk to us about what's important about public investments in HCBS, and can you share what's significant about the COVID relief funds and how they're helping workers? Thank you, Julie, and uh, it's really exciting to be in this room, um, but I also want to begin by joining the chorus of deep gratitude to Wendy Chanoon and the rest of the Women's Bureau for bringing us together. Um, this is the second time that I'm in this great hall, and for us to talk about equity is super, super exciting. So thank you. Um, again, I'm Hei Young Yun. I'm the Senior Policy Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. We organize 2.2 million domestic workers who work as nannies, house cleaners, and home care workers in private homes. And it's been, although we were left on the <laughs> cutting floor for not included in uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It's been so amazing to partner with SEIU uh, to really push for investment in care. And I think one of the best parts of, there were many highlights in that campaign, but I think one of the best parts is when our workers came together and showed up in on the Capitol Hills, really mobilized and really speaking up for why this investment is, is important. So to your question about um, why public investment is important, I want to begin by um, quoting our one of our beloved uh, champion of um, investment in home and community-based services, Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. I heard him on an uh, interview once where he said, many people need bridges to go to work, right? Just like bridges to work are needed for people to go and grow the economy. Many workers and their families need caregiving in their home for them to go to work. And so he was saying caregiving for many workers is a bridge to work, right? And that we really needed that investment. And so why we need this investment, as Leslie talked about both the, the enormous caregiving demand and what, what is happening on the labor side. So I want to spend a little bit more time drilling down on that. Caregiving and the need for care workers in this country is exploding, right? Leslie said 10,000 people turn 65, 80 day, every day, right? So over 80 million people will be turning 65 come 2040. Right? And it's estimated about 70% of those who turn 65 will need some kind of long-term care. So it's no accident that because of this enormous caregiving demand, home care jobs is also exploding. It is going to be, by 2030, home care jobs, and I'm going to repeat this a couple of times, is the single occupation that will be adding the most new jobs in our economy, right? By 2030, we're going to need over 1 million new home care jobs in addition to 4.7 million jobs that need to be filled to meet their caregiving need, right? So this demand is just exploding, right? But we have a crisis on the labor side. Right? As Leslie talked about, that workers are earning poverty wages, limited benefits, isolation. So this is creating a crisis where there is enormous amount of worker shortages across the country, 
right, right now, especially in this tight labor market. The worker shortages existed before the pandemic. One out of five home care workers thought about finding a new job because it was such low wages and poor job quality, right? So we have the situation right now where demand is extreme, enormous and the labor is worker shortages because lack of good jobs, low wages, limited benefits and job quality. So where does public investment fit in? Right now we have a system, care economy, where Medicaid Medicaid is the largest payer of caregiving jobs in our country, right? So s Medicaid as the largest payer of uh, home and community-based services, 73% of 123 billion of home care industry revenue is publicly funded, right? So think about it. Where do we need to lean in to really boost up this care economy is public investment. And there's always a long wait list for people to get on Medicaid's home and community-based services to get their caregiving they need. So as we've talked about, COVID relief funds and American Rescue Plan was a real opportunity. It was a real game changer in really beginning to shift the dynamics in the care economy. So as Julie also talked about, Leslie talked about the American Rescue Plan uh, invested about 12 billion into this program, right? It's a time limited, states have until 2025 to invest, but it was a game changer investment because what we see across the country is all 50 states, including Washington DC, took this money to invest in expanding and strengthening the system at the state level, right? And about 46 states are using that money to improve wages and working conditions for home care workers. 18 states are providing temporary wage increases, right? And 12 states took this money and decided that they're gonna raise the wages permanently. It'll be interesting to note that of those 12, obviously there are states like Washington where SEIU has done tremendous work, Colorado, Illinois, but also Florida, North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, adjoining the set of states to raise wages for workers on a temp permanent basis, right? So this initial investment is a real opportunity for us to build a robust care economy that Julie talked about. So Medicaid as the largest payer, the investment has started right? We're going to need to continue to invest in this program to really make sure that we meet as a country this enormous caregiving need that we face and that workers who do that work day in, day out, right, are treated with dignity and respect and fair conversation. Thank you so much, Hei Young. And I suspect that, that as Leslie and Hey Young were talking that uh, Martine and Ingrid and Sarah are also hearing very similar stories for what's happening in childcare right now. And so I'm gonna turn over to Sarah. Um, the, the Care That Works pilot program that you organize, it helps to bridge the gap between childcare and the construction trades. And this is an issue that is clearly a problem that Sarah Jane had talked about and Ariana talked about, right? And so would love to hear about the program that you work on and how you leverage public dollars to support workers and the program itself. Thank you, Julie. And just thank you everyone so much for being here. I have been really vibing with the energy in the room today. It's so great. Uh, my name is Sarah Jimenez. I'm here um, for the Care That Works Coalition. Uh, we are a multiracial feminist coalition working for an equitable care future. Um, our Care That Works pilot is a demonstration program to invest in women of color as childcare providers so that they can provide the childcare for mothers of color to enter Boston's unionized building trades, particularly through Building Pathways, which is the top trades of free apprenticeship program in Massachusetts and obviously well represented here today. <laughs> So these are some of the top paying jobs that you can get in Boston that don't require a college degree, but you have to be on site at 545 or even earlier, 
and most childcare programs don't open until six or later. So that early hour care is a major support for parents to pursue these careers, especially single parents, many of whom in Boston are single black and brown mothers in poverty. So as prompted, I'm gonna talk about how we're funded and then also how we deploy that funding through equity-driven design. So over time, we've put together six different types of funding. In total, we hope to hit um, 1.3 million before the end of this year. There are three types of private funding. So first, through our close partnership with the building trades, some of our earliest grants came directly from individual trades unions who are really committed to this mission. Um, also through union partners early on, we were able to get funds through two project, um, two project labor agreements that were negotiated on some of the large developments going up in our city. And then third, after operating for a little while with a bit of a better track record, we were able to secure a more traditional foundation grant. We also have two public grants and then a third one in the works. All three of them are through the city of Boston. Uh, one was through our city's um, Office of Women's Advancement. So this was a relatively new office, and our coalition engaged with them early on to encourage them to focus on childcare specifically. Uh, so when they requested grant proposals to build a supply of childcare in the city, uh, we were able to secure some of those. A second grant was jointly offered by that same office and, and also our city's planning and development agency. And the backstory on that one is that years ago, we learned of a requirement in our zoning code for certain developers to either build childcare facilities or contribute to a childcare fund. Uh, in our code, it's called the Inclusion of Daycare Facilities, established in the late 80s. So we learned there were actually funds that had been collected and then never allocated, so we got some of those as well. <laughs> and on top of that, Mayor Wu is now working to strengthen and expand that zoning requirement, so we're excited that the city will soon have even more childcare resources to work with. And then third and most recently, we applied for funding um, from our city's brand new Office of Early Childhood. Earlier this year, Mayor Wu and the City Council passed a spending package that was funded by the ARPA State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. So we worked closely with Councillor Julia Mejia to include $1 million to fund childcare for non-standard schedules. So that was just put out to grant last month. We're crossing our fingers right now. So that's all the funding. Now to the program and how it works. Very simply, we get the word out. Parents contact us. We match them with a the provider we give the provider a stipend. So on the face, straightforward. But of course, um, you know, what keeps us up is the work to design and redesign everything to best center low-income women of color as both the parents and the providers. So we beta launched this two years ago at a small scale, and we work with outside evaluators to capture key lessons toward that end. One lesson for parents is that to reach those hardest to reach parents, we really, really depend on the partners who have deep and trusted relationships in those marginalized communities. For example, Brookview House that serves families transitioning from homelessness. As you heard from Ariana and Leah on the other panel, these moms have never had anyone tell them that you would be a great carpenter or you would be a great electrician. And it really helps to have someone who says it and then sticks around to say it again and again as many times as it takes. We also quickly learned that for parents, coordination through this program is full-time work, even at a small scale. These parents really benefit from regular and frequent touch points and encouragement as they navigate the many stages um, that you go through on a training pathway. And then so relatedly, we have found the need to design um, a flexible youth scholarship for our program for the parents. And unfortunately, it can't cover the full cost of care, but it can offset costs temporarily and it can serve in emergencies if they arise, and we learned that they definitely do arise. For providers, first of all, our model is built around home-based providers uh, because even within the care workforce, they are disproportionately black, brown, and immigrant women because they are severely under-resourced and because they are embedded in the same communities as the parents that we want to reach. So many providers are highly motivated to help their neighbors, women supporting women. Many already do as much as they can, even without the compensation and even at a net cost to themselves. These are the women that we want to recognize in a resource in our program. So we work with SEIU Local 509 to identify childcare providers. The monthly stipend is a supplement on top of what the parent pays. 
It doesn't make care a good job, but it makes it a bit better. One key lesson for providers that we've learned is how crucial assistants are for providers to make those early hours work. And right now, as with so many other jobs, it's really difficult to find assistants. So that brings me to one of the biggest priorities that we have right now, moving forward into our next phase, being led by our wonderful community partner, New England United for Justice. We need to build a pipeline that interlocks with that parent pipeline into the trades that is focused on workforce development for home-based assistants and providers. This needs to be a development pathway that's designed for black and brown and immigrant women who already are providing care but are not paid for it. Communities that we think of as childcare deserts are full of these informal caregivers. So the pipeline will, of course, help build the size and capacity of our pilots provider network. But even more importantly, we see this as an opportunity to model an equitable and an even reparative approach to childcare workforce development so that when we win fuller funding for childcare and we make those care jobs into good jobs, we can ensure that women of color are not left out again. So that's where we are. I'm really grateful to share what Care That Works has done and learned. With a historic opportunity like the one we face now, I am really heartened to be in conversation in this room with folks today who know that the work ahead of us must be not only fast, but also just. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I love, I don't know if y'all noticed that at the end she said, when we win the funding. Yes, when we win the funding. And um, here to talk a little bit about when we did win some of that funding is Martine. Um, the, the work of child care providers and advocates and parents and child development experts around the country helped the American Rescue Plan to include significant funding, $40 billion for child care and early learning. Martine is at the Administration for Children and Families that has been administering and implementing those funds to make sure that the child care sector was stabilized uh, during the pandemic. Already it was falling apart before, it was not already in good shape, um, but the pandemic really drove its Mack truck over it. And so those funds helped to uh, put some Band-Aids together, I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, and um, also the, the Department of Health and Human Services recently put out some uh, sub-regulatory action around compensation for childcare workers. So Martine, I'd really like to hear about both of those things. Uh, I'm very happy to talk about them, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll, I'll just frame a little bit. The Administration for Children and Families um, at the Department of Health and Human Services, we uh, you know, effectively are the human services arm. Um, and a priority, a key critical priority for us right now is supporting the human services workforce more broadly. And our team working on childcare and early childhood um, matters at ACF, we have really been setting the pace for centering the needs of the early childhood workforce in those conversations um, in partnership with our federal colleagues at the Women's Bureau, um, and, and others. Um, so we're very happy to and honored um, to house the Office of Child Care that had the privilege of distributing the $40 billion in child care emergency assistance included in the American Rescue Plan. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that has looked like and what we hope that looks like going forward. Um, and then I'll go into some of the other things we're doing. Um, so the, 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 the money included a $29 billion emergency stabilization funds, which um, we have been working with states, tribes, territories to get out the door um, into the hands of folks who need it. Um, that money can be used for things and has been used for things like rent utilities, like literally keeping the lights on for child care providers. Um, it's also able to be used for goods and services. It's also able to be used for personnel expenses. Um, and the vast majority of providers who have received those funds have used them for personnel expenses. Um, that we know. We've, um, I think there's some, to, to date, I think there's something like 650,000 grants that have been distributed across the country to more than 200,000 providers across the country. 
um, that have a capacity to serve more than 9 million children. So we're talking about a pretty extensive reach um, so far. Um, those numbers keep ticking up. There's still money going out the door. Um, that was sort of the first big push. Now coming out there is um, uh, what is called, uh, uh, I'm, lo I'm losing my S words, stabilization, supplemental funding, thank you. The first one was stabilization funding, now we're getting into supplemental funding. Um, it's not as big of a chunk of money, but that is coming out on the heels of the initial stabilization push. And so states, territories, tribes, they're able to start accessing that funding now, and we're working with um, those grantee partners at the federal level, our, our grantees are the states, the territories, and the tribes themselves, to help make that money flow um, quickly and um, hopefully in you know sustainable ways. We actually have a colleague here, Kim Burgess Sims, today she's gonna be doing a, a breakout session workshop later that's gonna be talking about some of the things that states and localities are doing. So if you're um, interested in that, and not just using these dollars, but also how they're using these dollars to leverage existing dollars. We've talked about, uh, some folks on the panels this morning have talked about how we're leveraging dollars across different funding streams. Um, so if you're interested in that, please check out Kim's session. Um, so, that, so that's really where we're focused right now, helping the states, the tribes, and territories get that money out quickly. And, that's, and also just where we can be creative um, and that's where the suite of um, guidance that we released last week comes into play. Um, so we've been really thinking creatively about with the existing money that is there, um, with the existing policy and regulations that are there, where we can make it clear where there's flexibilities, where um, the grant, where grantees can move. Um, and so there was a, um, some guidance that was released from the Office of Child Care on um, how funding uh, can be used and examples of how funding has been used by states um, and jurisdictions to increase compensation for the child care workforce. There was a, also a guidance released by the Office of Head Start last week um, that similarly talks about using Head Start dollars um, in allowable existing ways to help increase um, Head Start employee uh, compensation. And we also had a, um, an additional piece of guidance um, from our preschool development grant birth through five team. So for states and territories who are recipients of those dollars, um, you should check that out as well. I also would be remiss if I didn't highlight um, some things that we're trying to do until there is additional congressional investment action. Um, I know that uh, federal uh, work can seem a little clunky compared to some other work, um, but uh, <laughs> we do try to be creative sometimes. Um, and this is one instance where we're really dedicated to making sure that we are clear where there are um, opportunities to leverage different funding streams, um, make that clear to uh, folks on the ground. Um, so we are very pleased that in addition to the guidance last week, we announced um, new preschool development grant, birth through five funding opportunities um, that are, um, I believe are on grants.gov right now. So if you're, if uh, states and territories, please check your eligibility. There is a one uh, year planning grant opportunity. There's also a three year renewal grant opportunity for those that are eligible. And then we also announced a new opportunity. And this is one where um, we, our, our teams came together across programs and across different types of funding stream to really think about how we can support the early care and education workforce right now. Um, so it's a new uh, opportunity that will create a national early care and education workforce center. And what this, what this does and why we're so excited about it is because it takes existing funding streams that were sort of dispersed across our program areas and it puts it in one place. And it says, we're gonna, we're gonna have this workforce center and it's gonna do research it's gonna provide technical assistance across states and local jurisdictions. Um, and that research and that technical assistance are gonna form one another and they're gonna form our policies going forward. Um, so that's an opportunity that's out there right now. And again, an example of how, um, you know, we're trying to be less clunky. We're trying to open up, um, uh, just open up opportunities 
to be able to create this vision for an early um, childhood sector that we we see, um, that we want to see in this country. And that for administration of children and families is one that meets the developmental needs of kids and their families in their communities um, where they are today. Um, and we know that that absolutely depends on a well qualified and well compensated workforce um, to lend stability um, to the field. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Um, that's just some some stuff about what we're doing now, but um, we're absolutely happy to be on this panel and happy to continue to partner with the Women's Bureau and other federal partners going forward. Thank you so much, Martine. Now we're going to move from the creative, crucial, and clunky federal level to the local level. Let's hear from you, Ingrid. You're the director of the Office of Early Care and Education in San Francisco with a focus on equity and systems change. What are you seeing right now? We're hearing tons about the child care staffing shortages. What's happening on the ground? And how are public dollars helping? And what else would make a big difference for you? Good morning. Um, Wow, this is, this is a historical moment to be able to be in the Women's Bureau and being able to speak about these issues. Because in San Francisco, it feels like we've been very alone in these conversations. And it just, um, it just sort of really highlights and amplifies um, the need to be able to, to invest in a workforce um, that everyone else has already commented about. Uh, and at the very local micro level, because San Francisco is, is small, um, we're seven by seven sort of square miles, 49 square miles. Um, we have a small child population in comparison to other urban um, places across the country. Uh, for children birth to five, we have around 45,000 children, which is not a lot. Um, and that is because we're one of the most expensive cities to live in. And uh, you know, several years ago, and, and this goes actually even predates um, maybe three or four years ago, um, even when um, we had Vice President Harris as our city attorney and then district attorney, uh, we implemented a universal preschool system back in 2005. And even then, we saw what the need was around building not only the infrastructure for birth to five, um, in terms of early care and education, but also the need to be able to build the pipeline, the workforce, the ability for um, women, especially women of color, to be able to have those educational opportunities, but also economic mobility. And so in 2018, um, and I'm very many thanks, I'm gonna shout out to two county supervisors who really helped spear, spear at, um, this proposition, a local proposition that taxed um, gross receipts tax and also um, property um, sort of um, commercial tax, commercial leases. Um, and that was um, Supervisor Norman Yee and Supervisor Jane Kim, who um, brought this forward and actually was able, to, we we're able to now collect $120 million a year um, from those fees assessed. From the $120 million, we're setting aside $70 million to really support the workforce in terms of the early care and education field. And in many ways, one, to raise a minimum compensation um, for people who are working in early care and education to $28 an hour. That's minimum, period. And then from there, building it up to be able to be at parity with our school district for people who are working in K to 12, and that means in everything, not only in salary, but also in benefits. We, as, as I speak right now, the ink is drying on a lot of those grants um, that we are extending um, to all the nonprofits that are have not only um, the workforce in early care and education, but also the people who support them too. And one of the things that we looked at is in order to create equity, right, educational equity. We also have to create the equity and those opportunities for the people in this care system that support children and families every day. And for many, many years, what we've done is we've expanded this care sort of economy, but really on the backs of women and women of color by having them subsidize 
the subsidy that they receive from not only, um, and I'm sorry, I know I'm in a federal sort of holy land here, but from the, you know, from the feds and also from the state, when we look at the child care reimbursement rates, these are very, very low, especially one, to be able to hire people who have the skills, the training, the education experience, but also to be sustainable, especially in places like San Francisco, and be able to say that this is dignified work. Of course it is, but we don't value it in that way. We look at it as something like it's a benefit to the family, when in fact, this is about life course. The people who care for our children birth to five are the ones who are impacting the most that development of children. And if anything has, to, has proven now, empirical evidence now, is that brain development happens within the first three years of a child's life. Language, cognitive, executive functioning, empathy, is all of that is developed. And yet when we undervalue the people who actually support that development, then we're actually undervaluing the society for which we're trying to build. And so through the Baby Prop C, which we lovingly call it now, we are putting minimum standards in terms of compensation and also working conditions. Because that's the other thing. People work 10, 12 hours a day in this industry, in this sector, and that shouldn't be so. If we have to be able to look at ways of people's benefits and the way of how they create economic mobility um, for themselves and for their families. Because as we wanna rise up and children make sure that children are arriving at kindergarten ready, that means that we have to create this infrastructure that supports the women who, by the way, it's 90% women. And of that in San Francisco, it's 85% women of color. And so with that, this is the investment that we're making long term. Um, it's funding that we're able to collect um, now on an annual basis. We're being able to build um, childcare spaces. We're able to create um, scholarships and other support systems for um, women who want to enter into early care and education field. So again, they have the economic mobility, but also the professional mobility um, to be able to look at this long term again as a career, as a way of being, being able to value um, their contributions towards, again, the life course of children, um, especially children of color in, in our city. Thank you so much. We have just a few minutes left. I want to just quickly note that, you know, the, the care infrastructure, the care economy is not complete if we don't also think about the ways that paid family and medical leave plays a role in, you know, people being able to take time that is paid to care for their loved ones. And so I think, you know, we all see how essential that is, is looped into all of this. Um, in our last few minutes, I'm just going to ask you to say kind of one or two sentences on, you know, if, if it could be different, if it looked different, what would it look like? What is your dream for the care work to look like? And Ingrid, can I start with you? Sure. Um, I think the way that I would love for it to look like is that you have a universal child care system that really underscores where that care is being provided. Um, and that we look at it in a way of, of human development and that supports that through not only a whole child approach but also looking at the people who make up that system through, again, through a dignified way that means wages, benefits, and every kind of quality of life that supports a just society. Thanks, you wanna go down the line? Go ahead, Leslie. So I think to answer that question, I'm gonna go back to uh, uh, Danielle and Brittany Williams. And I, I, I told you that Brittany was a third generation care provider in her family, um, but I asked her once about her own kids, and she said to me, yeah, but I don't want my kids to be the fourth generation of care providers, I want better for them. And so I would say if we can fix this broken system, then Brittany will want her children to be care providers too. So we at the National Domestic Workers Alliance have this vision. By 2030, we want every single domestic worker to earn a living wage and have access to benefits. 
So we want to get there along the way. We want to make sure everyone who needs the basic critical services and care, right, to have access to that, right? And so it's going back to the, the original vision when we started calling for a care economy this time around, right, as a part of President Biden's economic agenda, that we want to make sure that every person who needs that service has access to it, and every worker who provides it has a living wage voice and benefits, and that at the end of the day, it is about building an equitable and inclusive economy and society, because the workers who do this work are largely women, largely immigrant, and women of color. I know we're at time, so I'm going to actually cede my time to Sarah so I don't um, hold us over, but I'm generally ditto. <laughs> Thank you, Martine. Um, I would love to see us create a society where the reproductive labor in our communities is a formalized industry like any other uh, that is grounded by the people who do the work and receive the work, uh, the, care, the people who are cared for and people who are caring for one another. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Patricia. Let's make care the public good that it is. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you so much. This incredible discussion that really drove home for all of us um, how care itself is vital infrastructure and that it takes a partnership between workers and unions and community and cities and states and federal government to do this, but we can do it. Um, so Next up, and before our next uh, discussion, I actually have a video to share with you from our Secretary Walsh. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I want to thank you for being part of the Equity in Focus Summit. I especially want to thank Director Wendy chung Hoon and our Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor for their leadership in this critical work. In many ways, equity is the issue of our time. We are at an incredible promising moment. Under President Biden's leadership, our economy has added nearly 10 million jobs, and we are launching investments that will create millions of more good jobs in construction, high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and many other areas. So we have a historic task before us. We have to build the workforce to do those jobs and win our future. And that's also a historic opportunity. We must use this moment to bring equity to our labor market for women and people of color. It's the right and just thing to do. And quite honestly, our future depends on it. For many decades, the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor has been fighting for equity for working women, and that's why we're here today. Our new Good Jobs Initiative is working across our federal government to make sure that every job pays well and empowers working people. Together, we're making sure every worker has equitable access to good jobs of today and tomorrow. So what does that mean? We have to bring more women into the trades and all the good paying fields where they're underrepresented. That means training programs tailored for gender and racial equity. It means workplaces that are safe and welcoming for women. And it means a real and sustained commitment from employers, unions, and governments at every level. We also need to invest in our CARES infrastructure. We need to make sure that families have access to the quality childcare and elder care they need. We need to invest as a nation in paid family leave and medical leave. Everyone deserves a job with good benefits, like paid sick time. And we need to raise wages for women who are working in the CARES economy. They are disproportionately women of color and immigrants. They are the backbone of our workforce, and they deserve better. None of us can do this work alone. That's why I'm so grateful you have all come together today. And I want to ask each and every one of you to commit to this work in your business, in your union, in your cities and states. I pledge that my office in the Department of Labor in this administration will be your partner. Thanks once again.
So I, with that, with that, uh, I am thrilled to introduce this next panel uh, and welcome them up on the stage. Uh, these are our federal partners uh, from across the government who are here to really talk with us about current and future federal pandemic recovery and also infrastructure investments and the ways that gender and racial equity are being embedded in these funding opportunities, just as Martine described um, the Administration for Children and Families was doing, um, and the ways that funding can be used to create a more diverse and equitable workforce. Because we have a packed panel, and I'm sorry I'm a little distant from you standing up here, but wanted to get all of your voices in, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on their, on their um, bios. You have them if you use that QR code. Uh, but I will uh, first introduce you all. Uh, Nellie Abernathy is Acting Director in the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning at the Department of Commerce. Uh, Laura McDaniel, maybe... We'll come back around. I'll, I'll cue you in, but you can wave as well <laughs> since I got you in the wrong order. Laura McDaniel uh, is policy advisor for the Office of Recovery Programs at the United States Department of Treasury. Uh, Kay Ortiz, down at the end, is principal analyst at Analytic Services, who is supporting the U.S. Department of Defense Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainment Program. Michelle Perez, Acting Deputy Secretary, Office of Field Policy and Management at, the, at HUD, United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Amy Peterson is Senior Advisor in the Loans Program Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. And Paige Shevlin is Strategic Advisor for Infrastructure Workforce Development at the United States Department of Transportation. Thank you all for being with us today. We're visibilizing the commitment <laughs> to racial and gender equity across the federal government. Um, Kay, I'm actually going to start with you. Uh, and if you could just tell us a little bit about your work uh, with the Department of Defense and the Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainment Program, IBAS is what you call it. How has Department of Defense been working to really center gender and racial equity when it comes to workforce development? And also, what are the lessons you're learning along the way? Thank you, Wendy. And is this on? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Wendy, and all of her crew and Cornell for organizing this great event and for including us at the Department of Defense. I'll have to say there's been a lot of progress with gender equity been made since I started with the Department of Defense Industrial Base, which is a contractor, in the early 1980s. I was working with a major defense corporation, and the desk chair that was given to me was based on my gender, not my position in the company, or even the chair that would allow me to do my job the best. The rules were gender-based for the office equipment that you got. So a lot has changed in the past 40 years, but as been said here today, we have a long, long way to go to really get equity in the workforce. And that's why the Women's Bureau, the work that the Women's Bureau is doing is so important. As Wendy said, I support the Department of Defense Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainment Program, IBAS, that's led by Adele Radcliffe. Adele very much wanted to be here today and can, looks to continue her involvement with the Women's Bureau and, and the Department of Labor. A few years ago, Adele was seeing cracks in the workforce pipeline required to meet the department's need with the defense industrial base. That's the 10,000 companies that help to build this nation's weapon systems. We saw that the lack of skilled labor was a supply chain issue, much like not having enough semiconductors or batteries. So Adele started building what has evolved into an initiative called the National Imperative for Industrial Skills, or NIS. It was officially launched in March of 2020, and over the past two and a half years, NIST, the Department of Defense through NIST has invested about $130 million 
in 15 different programs to address how to train people with the traditional industrial skills, manufacturing skills, like welders, electricians, pipe fitters, those kinds of skills. Early on, we found that we needed to expand the pipeline and recruiting efforts beyond the traditional manufacturing demographics. There just weren't enough eligible workers in the manufacturing workforce, and the COVID accelerated retirements and really made the labor shortage even worse. So as Adele says, reaching out to non-traditional manufacturing workers is a numbers issue, but it's also the right thing to do. We're grateful for the current initiatives that support our activities to include women and minorities in manufacturing workforce. So from the early days, NIST has had programs that went beyond the traditional manufacturing communities. Today, I'd like to highlight a couple of our successes and talk about the areas that where we need help from organizations that are here today. Because of the acute need for workers in the shipbuilding industry, one of our performers, performer is like what you would call a grantee, started a program called Women for Boats, where they do a specific outreach and training program for women to build, to learn to build the submarines. This is based in Rhode Island. More than in the past 18 months, more than 300 women have gone through this training. Initially, we had very real challenges with retention, not only retention once the women got on the workforce, workplace, but also even retention with the training program, allowing women to get through the training program. So our performer developed innovative ways to increase women's participation in the program by raising their confidence level at the beginning of the program before they even started. They, they started a program that would allow the pros prospective trainees to get hands-on training, hands-on experience with the manufacturing equipment in the workplace before they even start the training. This allowed the women to have confidence that they could operate the machinery, they could perform the work, and gave them a level of awareness of what would be expected from them once they were in the workplace. These orientation activities have really paid dividends in raising the confidence level of the workers through the training process and a smoother transition once they're in the workplace. So we've seen positive results from this, but we've also had some of the issues that have been expressed here with the workplace culture. And one of our performers has developed a program where we enable a better relationship between the employers and the workers themselves. Instead of asking the government to serve as a translator between the employers and the workers, we build the relationships between the employers and the workers to start the conversations about what can be improved in the workplace itself. We've seen the lasting, pro lasting progress from being able to enable these relationships to be built. We've had these successes and we're still learning. And I'll say being here today really points out how much we don't know yet. As Adele says, we're not labor experts, but we want to look to experts like you to help get more women in the industrial trades. Some of the challenges that we face or we have people who start the training and then drop out because of language barriers, literacy, care issues, transportation issues, things that I'm sure you're all well familiar with. Some of our DOD funding cannot be used to address problems like this. 
So how can we collaborate with some of you to develop a continuum of care for these workers? We're also seeking better solutions for retention. How can we craft work schedules today that accommodates people's lives? Manufacturing, as you imagine, is hard to do remotely. How can we allow people to live where they want to live and still participate in the defense industrial base? And lastly, how can we build a team of advocate and, member, and mentors from minority communities to blaze the trail for others to come behind them? Thank you very much for including me. I will say that there is not one Department of Defense meeting I've been to in my 40 years that has the enthusiasm of this group today. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Kay, um, including for your point, uh, um, having been on the other side in community work, um, that, you know, as a federal department, you're looking for support and engagement from community partners um, and their expertise. So thank you so much. Paige, I'm coming to you next. Um, department of Transportation sort of hit the ground running with the bipartisan infrastructure law funds and implementation of them. So just offering you the floor to tell us what, what you've been doing to really lead on gender and racial equity um, from your position there in the funding opportunities. Thank you, Wendy, and happy to be here with all of you. I agree, this room has a lot of enthusiasm, uh, and it's a good way to uh, start a Thursday. <laughs> um, I, um, as, as Wendy said, I'm the uh, Infrastructure Workforce Advisor at DOT. My role is specifically around the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I want to start off by um, talking about our ideal for what we want to see on transportation projects that are um, you know, being built and operated across the country. And then I can talk about what we're doing to get there. So first of all, uh, we want to um, have those projects create good paying jobs with choice to join a union. And I do want to kind of um, uh, maybe myth bust a little bit uh, because I've, I've heard uh, in the prior panel a lot of conversations about, you know, these jobs being, you know, infrastructure jobs being, you know, good quality jobs. And that's how everyone talks about them. Um, that is not uh, a, a that, that is not necessarily true. We have to work to make them good quality jobs. And there are prevailing wages, there are regions with prevailing wages of $11 an hour, $12 an hour, $13 an hour. People, you know, get hurt and die on these jobs sometimes if they are not, um, if the right policies are not in place. So I do want to make sure that it's not a given that they are good quality jobs. It is actually something that we really have to work at. Uh, so that is priority number one. Uh, priority number two is that we uh, change the way that hiring and retention is done. Um, in, uh, especially, you know, in, in the construction industry is what I'm talking about because, to be clear, a lot of our funding is still going for highways and bridges. Uh, and so a lot of it is construction funding. And we have um, a great new tool that was provided by the infrastructure law, which is the use of local and economic hiring preferences, where we can preference the hiring of individuals who have certain um, uh, you know, economic disadvantages, who are aging out of the foster care system, for example, or are on public assistance. Um, you can also uh, uh, preference hiring from certain um, uh, geographic areas that are economically disadvantaged. You could preference people from uh, public housing projects. Uh, and uh, we really want to see more use of that, uh, as well as other policies uh, that are going to result in the hiring and retention of more uh, women and people of color. And then, um, uh, third, we really want to see more workforce training programs that are high quality training programs that are getting people into jobs and into registered apprenticeship. Uh, and I would point out uh, that uh, there, only that last one uh, is really about sort of the workforce system. And so our goals are not really just, you know, pumping lots of money into training for, uh, you know, construction jobs. Those first two are really about the policies that the transportation entities are setting as in terms of the jobs that they're creating and the way that they're doing hiring and the goals that they set for diversity, right? So we have both that demand side and that supply side that we want to see. In terms of how we're going to get there, uh, we are uh, really uh, going uh, 
full force on our competitive grants. Uh, we have $125 billion in competitive grant dollars uh, through the infrastructure law uh, over the next five years. Uh, we uh, have already started putting out some of these funds just recently. Last week, as an example, uh, we awarded something like $2 billion. The numbers are, are, are so large, I sometimes lose track. But uh, we, I know that uh, those grants, the infra grants, uh, they were um, really phenomenal in terms of the uh, partnerships that we saw with unions uh, and uh, the workforce training programs and the um, goals around equity. And just to give you know, uh, 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 one example, uh, we had a, a grant uh, to New York City, and uh, I don't know if New York City is speaking later, but um, New York City has a, a very strong um, uh, higher NYC program uh, that you know, includes um, participation uh, from uh, the program NEW, uh, which Amy here used to run. Um, and uh, so there will be a, a goal for 15% of women on that project, uh, as well as strong goals for you know, people that are people of color, um, people coming out of incarceration, and other programs that are supported uh, through that. Um, there are other examples uh, that I could share with you, but I know we're short on time. Uh, so I would I would say we are making progress on starting to putting out these competitive dollars in a way that is going to drive change. Uh, a lot of the money is also formula money uh, that uh, states control. We are doing uh, our best uh, to give them examples of how they can use uh, their dollars for workforce training, um, how they can use uh, uh, provisions like local and economic hiring, how they can make um, you know, good quality jobs on uh, their projects uh, so that um, uh, workers are supported and also uh, because honestly it's the only way they're going to get workers uh, you know I hear a lot about the 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 uh, workforce kind of shortage uh, and uh, that um, the way to address that is through making sure that these are really high quality jobs that people want to take and uh, that provide a career pathway for them uh, and uh, yes I think um, yeah I'll go ahead and stop there because I'm probably past my time I would love <laughs> to talk about a million other things with you all but uh, uh, I'll go ahead and stop. Well the whole point of this summit is for people to connect so hopefully if you have questions for Paige please find her um, but just want to thank you for the trans the enormous effort you put into and Department of Transportation has put into the transparency about this money <laughs> the quick information about it and just um, really yours and this whole panel's uh, clarity of purpose around good jobs and who's in them. Um, so Nelly, coming to you next, uh, and I heard, I've learned from both of you um, about sort of the pacing of this money. Uh, some of it's hitting the street very quickly, but how long will it take to sort of translate into jobs and investments? Um, so Nelly, just want to offer you the floor to talk about the funds that the Department of Commerce, um, which have not yet hit the streets, but you are doing active planning now to really center gender and racial equity um, in these investments. Thanks so much, Wendy, and um, thanks for having us here. I w just want to note that I work at the Department of Commerce for Secretary Raimondo. I think these are former labor secretaries. Yeah. It's very nice to see women labor secretaries. In the Department of Commerce, we have almost all male portraits. And I think that speaks to what we're trying to do here, um, which is really change the face and, and of what it means to work on the issues that commerce um, is traditionally known for, which is manufacturing, uh, technology, science, which um, obviously are, are places where there's a um, huge opportunity for women and people of color uh, to make a larger impact than we've historically been able to do. And, um, you know, the president and the secretary, Raimondo, as, as many others have said, have laid out a clear vision for our responsibility with these funds. Exactly as Paige said, we need to make sure they make they uh, enable us to produce quality jobs, which is not a foregone conclusion. And we need to make sure that those jobs are available to all Americans, particularly women and people of color and people from um, economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So I, I, at Commerce, what that means is through uh, three different funding programs, ARP, the um, Infrastructure Plan and now the CHIPS Act, we have over $100 million, sorry, I keep on saying million because yeah. that's like what I'm used to, that we're in a new world, $100 billion of um, investments going into communities across America. And the first tranche we actually did um, put out on the street already, we had from ARP 
funding for economic development at um, the Economic Development Administration, and we created the Good Jobs Challenge, which was um, about half a billion dollars to support uh, private sector, public sector, nonprofit union partnerships in order to get people into good jobs. And the idea was this isn't just a traditional workforce training program. We need commitments from employers up front that they're going to um, hire people who complete the program. And that was a real learning experience for us at the department because we embedded equity in the funding announcement and then we embedded it in the way we scored applications and the results speak for themselves. Um, every, we, we awarded 32 grants, every single one has a holistic approach to equity. And um, just a few stats on that, um, the, the grantees are projected to place over 50,000 workers into quality jobs. All 32 include holistic equity strategies. 11 serve indigenous communities, five serve coal communities, 11 grantees focus at least some portion of their training on formerly incarcerated or justice impacted individuals. And almost all of them support special, um, have, have a focus on either women um, in, or uh, communities of color or rural populations. And, and ha at least more than half of the grantees have direct union engagement, but all of them have labor standards. So, so we really learned that if you put it in the, but if you tie the money and, and prioritize this, like you see results, mm -hmm. not rocket science. So now we're doing this, um, we, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we received more than $40 billion to bring high-speed affordable broadband or internet of some kind to all Americans. And our flagship program, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, um, we're gonna award money to states. So they will be the uh, grantees and they, it is formula funded. However, we get to approve their plans for how they are going to spend the money. So we have uh, released a notice of funding opportunity that requires them to submit the plans. And in these plans, each entity needs to include a workforce development plan that has a specific description of how they're going to ensure the job opportunities are available to a diverse pool of workers. And each entity has to submit a plan for local coordination and outreach. And perhaps most importantly, each entity has to be prepared to submit, um, they have to submit data on the demographics of their workforce and expect that this data will be public. So we will be able to have transparency around the actual impact of these dollars and how that's flowing through, not just to the states who are our grantees, but to the sub-grantees and the grantees after that. So, this is the the whole idea of this was to create space for um, the the regional and local ecosystem to partner with the states, with the employers, and um, with the sub grantees to do this to do the very very difficult work we know of um, actually diversifying this workforce. And uh, we're we now have fifty billion dollars to build semiconductors. Uh, in the US, this is gonna create jobs both in the construction of the fabs, uh, more than 50,000, and then also long-term jobs in the fabs, in engineering, um, in manufacturing, in software development, and um, we're gonna have to do the, same, do the same thing, figure out what are the levers that create that space to the demand signal to allow the, uh, the um, local community to step up, which includes employers, it includes states, but it also includes obviously all of you. Um, I will say some of that money can actually be used directly on workforce development, but in all of these things, we're very clear that um, the money can be used when we say workforce development, we have the flexibility to have it cover wraparound services like childcare, like transportation, the other obstacles we know that need to be um, covered. The, <laughs> um, the the last thing that I want to say about all of this is that um, as you all who work in this space know and can tell me, um, this is quite hard. And it, it's a, you know, as the secretary said to me today, um, something unrelated, but it's really her approach to all things. If we run, you know, 100 miles per hour at an obstacle, maybe we can move it an inch. 
And so that, that's our strategy. Hopefully we're going to move it much more than an inch, but like we are all in on running 100 miles per hour at this um, challenge with the hope that we can really move the needle. And the reason I think maybe we can do it more than an inch is because I think there's a tipping point from what I've learned from all of you in the last uh, six months as we've been trying to do it is like as we change the face of what this looks like, it'll build on itself. So it's a historic opportunity to move the needle and then like start that snowball effect. So we're excited. We have a lot still to learn. So please come find me or my colleagues from the Commerce Department after this. Thank you so much, Nelly. And again, that offer to partner with Real Clarity of Purpose. So thank you so much. Um, Amy, coming to you next to hear about how uh, you are uh, helping the Department of Energy really embed equity in your work. Um, but also, since Paige uh, shared this about you, in case folks aren't looking at the QR code, um, you have done this at the ground level before. And so just you know, what work and partnerships are really central to making sure that this work is done right? as Paige and Nellie have both alluded to in K. Thank you. Um, sorry, that might be really loud. Uh, I am just thrilled to be here. And uh, one of the things that I think is so special and important about today is um, having home care and the care uh, workers and the construction and clean energy workers in the room together. Um, coming from uh, a background that includes lots of stuff, but workforce development and people being like, how do we create jobs? Where are the jobs? To know that there are a million dollar, a million, sorry, a million jobs at least on both sides um, coming forward in home care and in construction and clean energy and to have, and I'm just grateful for the Women's Bureau and for Wendy and the work everyone's doing to kind of ground in this moment the opportunity to make those jobs available to women, uh, communities across the country, and to make them good jobs, and to work for a president who talks about making them union jobs, and to really uh, be doing this. It's a, it's a really important time, and it's exciting to be here. I'm at the Department of Energy, and um, I work for Secretary Granholm. I'm going to give you a couple hints on how to figure out the federal government, because I'm new to it, and I'm trying to figure it out. So one, follow Secretary Granholm on every social media. She's going to tell you everything we're doing at the Department of Energy, and she's got such enthusiasm for the jobs, jobs, jobs that are being created and the importance of the work that's happening in energy across the country and for our planet. So I encourage you to do that. We have the bipartisan infrastructure law. I encourage you to go to our website and to go to our page on the bipartisan infrastructure law so you can see all the funding that's coming out. We got $62 billion in the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and it's creating new programs. We're completely reorganizing the Department of Energy and we're putting big uh, dollars and big um, hydrogen hubs and battery manufacturing facilities on the streets in communities across the country, and we're figuring out how to do that. And so uh, we're really looking to people across the country to help us do that and to do that right. Um, in the federal government, one, I encourage you to sign up for every email list because you'll figure out some are really good and they're going to tell you everything you need to know about all the funding that's coming. So go on DOE's website and sign up for all of them and then figure out which ones you like. Um, we put out our money through funding announcements, so FOAs. Um, I encourage you to look at them in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law page. So what we're doing at the Department of Energy, there's a team of people that are focused on equity, Justice 40, quality jobs, and engagement. So first, do people here know what Justice 40 is? Some? Okay. So go look it up. What's amazing about the money that we're putting out, um, we're asking for a community benefit plan, and it has four components. So one is engagement, so stakeholder engagement. One is Justice 40. One is quality jobs. And one is diversity. If you're here trying to figure out how to get more tradeswomen into our work, you fit into all four of those buckets. And so it's pretty amazing how the work that you're all doing 
can be the answer for how we do this in an equitable way, how we bring jobs into disadvantaged communities, how we make diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility really happen. Uh, for people who don't know, Justice 40 is about making sure that 40% of the benefits uh, from clean energy go to people in disadvantaged communities, and that can mean jobs. It can mean jobs for tradeswomen. It can mean jobs for people in disadvantaged communities. Paige went through a lot of different categories of people who should have access to this work. Um, so it can also mean small businesses. There's a lot of tradeswomen, I'm sure, who are kind of at that level, and I talked to one yesterday who's starting their own businesses, so let's get more women-owned businesses out there in the unions, in the unionized uh, workers who've come up through the trades. That would be just amazing. I work in the loan programs office, so in addition to all the money I just talked about, there's billions of dollars. Again, it's kind of hard to fathom, right, in projects. I'm very accessible, and I would encourage you to to reach out to me, especially if you know of a loan programs office funding that's coming to your community. We're in Nebraska and Utah and Louisiana um, and Ohio, and uh, we're going to be a lot of places across the country. So I encourage you, we would love the private employers that we partner with to be partnering with groups uh, in cities and states, et cetera. Um, I want to talk uh, also uh, for people who know about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, one of the most amazing things personally for me in that act is the fact that it has an apprenticeship requirement. By 2023, projects will have to have 15% uh, apprentices, and so that's a really good opportunity to highlight the opportunities for bringing more people into the unions, into apprenticeship programs, um, and really uh, focusing on apprenticeship readiness programs and pre-apprenticeship programs. And that kind of brings me uh, to, the, to, to what I really want to talk about today is it is amazing how much the words that um, represent what the tools are that people who've been doing work with tradeswomen for a long time know about, right? Pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship readiness, um, apprenticeship programs, uh, project labor agreements. People in uh, government generally, and I think even in the private sector, don't necessarily speak that language. Um, people in city and states are trying to figure out how to put programs together that bring all of these kind of building blocks together. How do we have our workforce system connect to an apprenticeship readiness program, maybe one that just focuses on women? How do we make a direct connection with the building trades? How do we think about negotiating a project labor agreement that focuses on including women? Um, they need your expertise, and they need you to sit down at the table with them and talk about how to do that. Um, it's really important that we spread the message. It's so amazing to see you all here today, especially the trade, I love you all, but especially the tradeswomen. Um, I, right? Um, I continue to talk to people who don't believe for one second that the building trades include women of color or include women um, or are diverse. And so it's really important to get in front of people and to show the diversity that exists um, so that it can grow astronomically. And I'm going to grab onto that 300,000 number and figure out, like, can we when, when can we double that? How can we really bring that number up? So thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Michelle, uh, coming to you next uh, at HUD. Um, I know that you're not implementing bipartisan infrastructure law dollars, but you have clearly underlying appropriations. And you were actually one of the first people I met when I came into my role. And you had this incredible way of making sure that all the, all the priorities are integrated all the time. So tell us how you're doing that in, in HUD's underlying appropriation. Thank you, Wendy, and hello, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm in the room. I'm also going to say I feel a lot of power in this room, and that's a really grounding <laughs> experience. <laughs> I just want to say that out loud. Um, I also want to say that I feel at home in this space, not just with this federal partners, um, all of us, but also uh, with the Cornell Worker Institute. It's my alma mater, for what it's worth. And, and I, I think there's a, a beauty when academic institutions are leading the work as partners, as champions and advocates, with the federal government, with all of you. So from a position of power, this is really what I came to talk to you about today. Um, 
shared definitions and common understandings. I, I want to start there uh, because we're talking about, unlike Amy, I, I consider myself a, a long-term bureaucrat. I have like 22 years of federal service. My first time around, though, in a political role. And it's a really exciting place to be when you know all the shortcuts, the, the, the ladder, the booby traps, where to, right? This is where that knowledge is useful to really advance, push, and make movement. And I think I want to start it out with uh, a recognition that it starts with our history. 1934, right, the Fair Housing Act, um, there was a memorandum issued to, by the president to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and lauded and championed by our secretary, Marsha Fudge. Um, and I'm going to read the name of it because I think it's important to sort of baseline this conversation. Redressing our nation's and federal government history of discriminatory housing practices and policies. This came out look, the first week of the administration, and it basically said to HUD, get it right, <laughs> right? There is no equivocating on the fact that we contributed and have been complicit in the circumstances that we find ourselves in today. And so this assumption that we know how to do it simply because we come into these positions of power isn't exactly accurate. We have to do the work, and we have to both work with our partners, train our workforce internally to really understand how do we do an equity assessment in which gender, uh, uh, ethnicity, race is material in that analysis? What does it look like when we're successful in doing that? And so that's part of the work that HUD is undertaking right now, normalizing the conversations, and they're not easy conversations to have, but also operationalizing equity as a consequence. So bottom line, who do we serve? Who are the people who come to HUD for support? Well, 75% of households the, um, that receive HUD rental assistance are women heads of households. A 2020 annual homelessness report found that 39% of all people experiencing homelessness are black, although black people only represent 12% of our population. We support 6 million HUD-assisted households. And mind you, these are not strictly public housing residents. These are people who get Section 8 vouchers. These are people who are living in privately owned, managed, and operated, subsidized HUD-assisted housing. So though there's a whole panoply of places where HUD assistance can go. But the truth of the matter is we know, because of the disinvestment in housing, that it's not going to all the people who need it. So. When we're talking about communities that are in need of economic opportunity and economic mobility, it's not just the people who were lucky enough to get the benefit of a HUD-assisted Section 8 voucher, right? It's the people who live within these communities who depend on them to provide a roof over their head. Why my role is valuable in this discussion, uh, I am the Assistant Deputy Secretary of the Office of Field Policy and Management. So I oversee all of the regional and local offices all across the country. And I want to tell you plainly that there are 64 of us, 64 field offices all across the country, hud.gov forward slash local. There are only two websites I'll give you. That's one of them, hud.gov forward slash local. And you can find people who report to me <laughs> who will answer the phone and will talk to you about how and in what way we do this work in community with community. Billions pass, back to the B, right? Very Austin Powers, right? Billions pass through HUD to states, cities, towns, housing authorities, developers, nonprofits for community development, for the construction, repair of affordable housing. Also in my office is the uh, office of Davis Bacon Labor Standards. So I also want to say there's a recognition that these two places, economic opportunity and mobility, are together. I don't know how many of in this room know what Section 3 is. Hands? A few. Right. For most people, it means nothing other than the one that comes after Section 2, right? It doesn't have meaning, but we talk about it. Right? Paige, you just made reference to it. It stipulates that the funds that HUD invests in communities should also be utilized to boost local employment of the residents who are low income and increase access to contracting to businesses who train and employ local workers who are in those communities. What an incredible opportunity, right? Section 3 drives investments of HUD dollars to workforce development, to gainful employment. But is it working, right? This started with the, the Civil Rights Act, right? This the, was a part of 
equal opportunity. And so in this administration, under the leadership of Secretary Fudge, you know, we, we looked at the language behind it to the greatest extent practical. Well, how do we make it practical? How do we realize that change? And so we've had intentional engagement with so many of the partners that are here today, advocates, grantees, Section 3 businesses, other federal agencies and residents, and we ask that question. How do we increase the potential? And what we realize is that it's very many ways, it's an empty mandate. It's saying Section 3 exists, you should use it. But when we talk to the Section 3 contract owners, how do I get it? How do I know where it exists? I call the housing authorities. Nobody knows how to answer that question. How do we connect those places? Because the truth is all of our programs intersect in meaningful ways. Uh, government redressing, back to that memorandum from the president, it means to remedy or to set right. And that's what we are attempting to do. Uh, so at this point, I'll give you a very specific example of how we're doing that. Uh, the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes, that's the name of the office at HUD, very long name. They improve health outcomes by improving housing conditions. So we're talking about Justice 40, environmental justice, poverty eradication. One of the things that they've done is that they have substantially reduced elevated blood levels in kids under six nationwide. How do they do that, you ask? Lead bait abatement, lead-based paint abatement and remediation. There is federal funding that exists to do this work, and we've targeted the total number of units on an annual basis that should be safe for children to live in, right? This is basic stuff. What we found as a consequence of COVID-19, amongst others, is that of the current active funding that's on the street today, 80% is unspent. So there is a total of $870 million for a total of 35,000 units that we know we need to remediate. We need to make safe for the children who live there. But only 20% of that has been spent. Why, you ask? Well, COVID, everything's shut down, right? We know this. But now that COVID, to some extent, is, is, is lessening in many communities across the country, and we need to focus on this because these health risks and impacts are far more significant, how do we get them back up to speed? And the truth is what we're finding from these entitlements that we give the funding to is that they can't find vendors. You require certification to do lead-based paint I can't say it, lead-based paint abatement. And to do so, it varies by the state that you're in. You have to go through training. You have to then be, go through an examination. And in order to do so, you need to know that it's available, where to get it, and pay for it. And in this respect, HUD's funding also can be provided for training. So this is a way in which we can help our grantees expend monies that if they don't spend, guess what? They have to give it back. And we can't have that because these units need to be fixed for the families that live in them. And so in this respect, we are working with uh, not only EPA and SBA, SBA, where we're asking our grantees to tell us, where are you not spending it? Where are you not finding the vendors? And how do we work with you through, guess what, the Section 3 program to find residents who are excited, can't wait to be trained and certified, need assistance, and who could potentially grow these businesses such that they can begin to hire other Section 3 beneficiaries in the communities and grow this workforce so that then we can address this critical issue. It really is a win-win. We need to make the commitment. It can't just be a proclamation. We have to follow the program through its logical conclusion, and we need our workforce in the community in partnership with you to activate it. So I'll stop there only to say that there are lots of other places where we can do this. Some of you may have heard of PAVE. Uh, it is the Property Appraisal Valuation and Equity Effort, which basically uh, identifies the fact that there is harsh discrimination happening right now with property appraisals. Guess what the uh, occupation of appraisers looks like in America today? Over 90% white and 90% male. Right? There's a pipeline issue at play here, and that's part of the work that we need to do. Housing quality inspectors, there's a need for us to go to all of these units to make sure that they're safe and habitable for the families that live in there. But we don't have enough inspectors. Right, This is another space that we can engage in, not to mention housing counseling. We are in an affordable housing crisis. This is another occupation. So understanding the housing industry writ large, where the pipeline needs are, where we are seeing our grantees actually having difficulty in expending their funds, this is where we can make an impact, and this is how we begin 
to set it right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. If you can't write as fast as Michelle can talk, or any of them can talk, find them after. These are your allies in federal government. They have the ears of their secretaries um, who are really committed to equity. Um, so Laura, I'm coming to you next. Um, and your money is yet different money as well. So we'll unpack that a little bit. But the, the ARPA money, and then this acronym, SLFRF. <laughs> I'm going to leave it to you to say it because it's fun. Um, but these funds have been coming out from Treasury at, at, for longer than the BIL dollar, the bipartisan infrastructure law dollars. Um, and they're flexible. They're really flexible. Like, I don't know if you were in the room um, when Sarah Jimenez was talking about care that works. Um, it's a Boston-based uh, model. Um, but, uh, you know, the benefit of having those flexible dollars to really address critical issues like care, child care. Um, so tell us a little bit more about SLFRF and, um, and also how you're really baking in equity to these dollars. Sure, sure. Well, first, um, thank you for having me here. And um, you did really well with the acronym. Um, mm -hmm. I want to start off, uh, you know, as my colleagues in the Department of Commerce mentioned, um, you know, we will have our first um, portrait of a woman um, secretary of the treasury and we also have um, our first native treasurer chief malarba so your dollar bill will soon have oh, two women's signatures on it which is pretty exciting so yeah yeah um, so as was mentioned, you know, our program is a little bit different, but it is complementary to the other programs that you've heard on the stage today. So what I'll do now is I'll give you um, a bit of an orientation or review to the program and then leave you with three key takeaways I hope you'll remember about SLFRF. So um, the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Program, SLFRF, is the part of the American Rescue Plan Act le legislation that delivers $350 billion to state, local, territorial, and tribal governments. The funds were dispersed in two tranches, and I won't go into too much detail about all of that, but I'll leave you with over 99% of the appropriated funds have been dispersed, and over 96% of the second tranche funds have already uh, been dispersed. So the funds are out there now. Um, recipients have until December 31st, 2024 to obligate the funds, and until December 31st, 2026 to expend them. Um, this program provides substantial flexibility for recipients to meet local needs. Um, the eligible use categories are split into four buckets, which I'll um, review very briefly now, and they're all to um, respond to the public health emergency and its negative economic impacts. So the first bucket I want to mention is the revenue loss bucket. So this is um, by far the most flexible, and it's for any service that's traditionally provided by a government. And it could also include the next three eligible use categories that I'll mention. Uh, the next one is the response to the public health um, emergency and the neg impact, negative economic impacts of the pandemic, which is also another mouthful. Uh, but this is the eligible use category where recipients can use funds for things such as child care, wraparound services, affordable housing, capital expenditures, all things that are uh, responsive to the um, public health emergency. Next, we have premium pay, which is for essential workers. And finally, we have the water, sewer, and broadband eligible use, which is for necessary investments in those areas. Um, I want to give you a couple of concrete examples of what um, it's looking like on the ground, how recipients are uh, expending the funds. So the first I want to share is from, kind of going west to east, is from San Diego, California. And so they've made a $10 million investment in a pilot program with public universities, community colleges, child care providers, and school districts. And these funds are using them in the pilot for um, job training for new early, um, new early childhood educators. And their plan is to increase um, child care worker wages. The next one I want to share is from um, Harris County, Texas. So they have um, a $900,000 uh, 12-week tr job training program for child care providers. And then the last one is right here in the District of Columbia. Um, the city is investing $60 million to support um, uh, a minimum wage increase for employees in the Department of Disability provider settings. Uh, so, you know, the eligible uses are structured so that um, recipients can, you know, address, you know, underlying, um, you know, disparities. So Treasury recognizes that underserved um, communities have experienced disproportionate impacts of the pandemic. Um, so this includes low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. So we encourage um, recipients to address economic and social disparities to ensure an equitable recovery for all. 
um, the reporting guidance, you know, as you'll see in this program, is uh, it supports you know equity by design, and so we encourage our recipients to you know engage with their communities as they're developing their projects, um, and also we provide government to government support um, to tribal governments. If you visit our website, you'll find the Equity and Outcomes Resource Guide. So this provides examples of equity-focused processes that recipients are undertaking to ensure that the funds reach the um, communities that need it most. So you'll find examples of equity budgeting tools, procurement assessments, and other, um, other methods that they're using to make their investments. So um, through that lens, I would like to highlight um, three things that uh, illustrate the flexibility of the funds. So the first is one that I've already mentioned, so that's the revenue loss um, eligible use. And so we have, it's the most flexible, by far the most flexible use of the funds. We have streamlined uniform guidance, so to help you with the procurement process. And you can, again, use these funds for any service um, traditionally provided by government, which could include the other categories, unless we've stated otherwise. Um, the next thing that I would like to highlight is that Recipients can transfer these funds to other entities. So for example, you can transfer these funds to nonprofits, transfer them to for-profits and other governments. Also, you can pool the funds. The last thing um, I want to mention as a kind of key takeaway here is that um, these funds can be layered with other programs. Um, so that could look like um, you know, being part of the capital stack for an affordable housing investment, also use it for water and sewer infrastructure projects, um, and you can also use this as non-federal matching dollars. And so for all of the uses, you know, that I've mentioned, you will want to look at our guidance to make sure, um, you know, that you have a full picture of, you know, what's eligible for the program. Um, and to sum it all up, you know, I want to share that the state and local fiscal recovery funds program is $350 billion that are currently available um, across four eligible use categories, you know, that I mentioned. The funds can be transferred to other, um, you know, other entities, other partners, and finally, you know, when Treasury designed this program, you know, we had a keen focus on um, the ways that these investments can affect various populations differently, and we really encourage our um, recipients to, um, you know, use their funds to invest in long-term outcomes for the communities that need it most. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, so your bellies are full, they're also hungry, we're going to break for lunch, but please help me thank this panel again. I should have said your, your, your minds are full, your hearts are full, your bellies are hungry. <laughs> um, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, thank you to all the speakers uh, that you've heard from this morning. It was very thought-provoking, a lot of handles that we can grab onto, um, and now we're going to move into our lunch break. So for our virtual audience, please come back to join us at 12.45 p.m. Eastern. And with that, I'll give you all instructions. Uh, Women's Bureau staff is going to help escort everybody to the cafeteria, which is on the sixth floor. So if you have pre-ordered lunch from Panera, there are going to be distribution tables set up there, and you can grab your lunch. And for those who didn't have a chance to place an order, please note that the cafeteria upstairs, the kitchen is not in service. So encourage you to talk to one of our colleagues at the Women's Bureau who can share information about dining nearby or delivery. Um, there are restrooms just outside the Great Hall as we um, get up to the sixth floor by the cafeteria. Um, and after lunch, we're going to return for another panel uh, and remarks from our special guest, the second gentleman. So do please come back promptly at 1245. Thank you. We are, um, we are what makes a work work, actually. So uh, uh, women uh, who are here spending time together, learning from each other, and, and exchanging ideas so we can go back and change um, what's happening with workers right now, elevating their voices and bringing value into work. So no, to kick off this uh, opening session, uh, we are going to have a, a video from someone who is leading the labor movement at the right time. It's, it, it took too long for her, for a woman to be the leader of the labor movement, 
but she is the, the, there's a saying that things happen to the person at the right time because she's the right person to lead us. So Liz Schuler is indeed the right person to lead the labor movement in the United States of America because workers are rising and workers are demanding more rights. So um, next, we are going to kick off this afternoon program with a special video message with, from the first woman. This is historic. It's her story to head up the largest federation of unions in the country. She is a visionary leader, a long-time trade unionist, a dear friend, and a collaborator with the Worker Institute at the ILR School. She's one of our founding board members, so we, she adds value not just to what she does for workers, but how she elevates ideas, innovation, research, and practice at, at supporting that work across the United States. But for us at the Worker Institute, she's a partner as a board member of, the, um, of, uh, of our a worker institute at the LR school. So we're going to listen to a video and a message from the leader of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, our president, our, our, our historic leader, Liz Schuler. Let's listen to it. Hi, I'm Liz Schuler, and I'm so glad to join all of you for this summit. I want to thank the Department of Labor, Women's Bureau, and the Worker Institute at Cornell for putting this event together and for drawing attention to the importance of equity in the workplace. And as the president of the AFL-CIO, I have the privilege of representing 12 and a half million working people in 58 unions, including the more than 15,000 nurses in Minnesota who just went on strike this month. That strike the largest private sector strike of nurses in US history, tells a larger story about how, quote, women's work is consistently undervalued in our economy. Those nurses spent the last two and a half years on the front lines of the pandemic, getting our loved ones through some of the most trying days of their lives. And they were often doing this work at great personal risk to themselves and their own families. And now in return, their employers are denying them the basics like safe and sufficient staffing levels, predictable scheduling, and decent wages. But those nurses had each other. They had the power of collective action. They could band together to call out bad actors and fight for the changes they were owed. That's not always the case for women in the trades or other male-dominated fields. Trades women can often be the only woman on the job site. And I know how that feels to feel like you have to speak for every woman and advocate for all of them on your own. And that's why I see it as our job as a labor movement to look at all of the challenges women face in the workplace, from being undervalued to being isolated, and find ways to address them. And in the trades, that meant starting new programs like Lean In Circles for Union Tradeswomen, a curriculum for women in construction to give them the tools they need when they face discrimination and harassment on the job and grow their leadership skills. It also looks like developing programs to provide flexible, affordable childcare so that women who work in the trades can do their jobs knowing their children are safe and well cared for and getting into high schools to let more students, especially students of color, know about apprenticeship programs and the family sustaining careers that follow, like we're doing with our new program, Permission to Dream. And we're continuing to work with the Biden administration to make sure that the rollout of legislation like the Infrastructure Bill, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, create opportunities for everyone. And we are making sure that we, our unions, are opening our doors and our apprenticeship programs to more women and people of color and helping them access those jobs. That's how we'll make the trades more accessible, more equitable, and more fair. And we aren't stopping there. We know that unions ourselves, we give workers power. We create real equity. So we're opening our doors and bringing more women of people of color to our unions and our federation. Our goal is for everyone, from nurses to electricians, to have a voice on the job so they can advocate for the change and the support they need, from training to childcare to fair pay. 
and we are going to keep fighting everywhere from Washington to the work site for policies and programs that lift everyone up. The labor movement is for everyone and we will keep fighting to make sure good jobs in every industry are accessible to everyone. And I'm so glad to know that all of you are in this fight with us and I can't wait to hear about all the ideas that come out of this summit. Thank you so much. And that's what we'll be doing this afternoon, um, coming up with ideas and sharing them. And we at the Worker Institute at our school will be publishing a report that will be available next spring. So please stay connected with us. Uh, before we go to our, our, our breakout this, uh, uh, working groups, we, um, we are going to have the next panel. But it wasn't Liz Schuller incredible. Let's give her another round of applause, even though she's not here with us. Her people are here, and her, uh, and her leadership is with us. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce another visionary woman from the AFL-CIO to lead our next plenary discussion on increasing women in a male-dominated, higher-paid careers. Mia Dell. Yes, coming. <laughs> is the deputy director of advocacy at the AFL-CIO, who helps lead the federation's development of policy and strategy to build the power for 12.5 million members uh, of uh, members of the federation and the labor movement. Welcome, Mia. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you all for allowing us to speak more about this important issue of getting more women into high paid male dominated fields. Um, we're really focusing on skilled trades here today. Um, but first I'm gonna introduce our four panelists before we start with some questions. So we have Erica Ehama, Deputy Director for Jobs to Move America. She has spent 17 years building unions throughout industries, most recently focusing on the South. We have Karen Dove, the Executive Director of ANU, leading this organization that improves people's lives through workforce training and supportive services. We have Mayor Kim Norton from Rochester, Minnesota, first woman mayor of Rochester, and previously served in the Minnesota Legislature and the City School Board. And then we have Maggie Duino, Deputy of Compliance for UMass's Building Authority, working to ensure compliance standards are met on all construction projects in the UMass campuses. <laughs> you brought your fans. Um, so my first question is for Erica. Um, so Jobs to Move America works to get women and people of color into green manufacturing jobs all across the US. So how are you creating pathways and opportunities for women in cities across the US? Yeah, um, I, I, I really appreciate this question, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't say happy belated Black Women's Equal Pay Day, yesterday, yeah. September 21st. Yeah. Okay, so that transitions beautifully into this conversation. Um, so Jobs to Move America is a national pol policy advocacy think tank organization where we're focusing on creating good jobs in the green, in green economy. And basically, we're doing this through creating pathways um, in alternative forms that we haven't really seen in the manufacturing space. So one of our key tools is through um, community benefits agreements, which is an um, agreement between the employer and the community where they work together to try to figure out what, it, what are the issues of the community that need to be resolved? I think I need to step back, though, to really put context to it to help kind of shape the tone of this question. Because what we are seeing right now, um, specifically in the South, is a migration of uh, manufacturing down into the region. At first, it was in the northern, midwestern areas of America, and then it went overseas briefly, and it came back is coming back to the South. So what we're seeing happening in the South is this boom of manufacturing happening and is in the green economy. So all of this, these resources are being released by the federal government to update our infrastructure. 
With that being said, there's new manufacturing that's never existed, not even in America, but in the world, like electric batteries, for example. Like we probably saw one or two electric battery plants in the last 10 years, but now what we see is they're popping up every day as new companies. So what that means is that there's a whole new industry that's been been um, developed. And in this society, and the way Jobs to Move America see things, is the best way to really improve a workforce is to catch it during transition. This is not a transition. This is a new beginning. So this is an opportunity for us to really set the standards of what good jobs can be. So we're talking about higher paid jobs in manufacturing. We ha have to think about the higher paid jobs in manufacturing and making them accessible to women. But really what we have to think about also is going beyond just the bread and butter of wages and healthcare access for good jobs, but also thinking about the quality of good jobs. And so if we're trying to create this bridge through community benefits agreements to improve working conditions, we have to look at it holistically. That includes safety in the workplace. That includes free of discrimination. It includes free of um, harassment, bullying, all of those things. And this is what we hear women in manufacturing spaces deal with. Their complaint is not the wages. The issue is that they're, you know, they're challenged with, um, yeah, being a woman in the workplace, having men dominated around you. Imagine the signs. I mean, we heard examples of it earlier today. So what we're trying to do is we're, we actually have partnerships with different corporations right now. Our newest partner is um, a bus company called New Flyers, a major bus manufacturer, the largest electric bus manufacturer in North America. Their biggest plant is in Anniston, Alabama. Um, we have a partnership with them to actually create pathways to these jobs through apprenticeship programs. We have a pre-apprenticeship program to get people into the industry, and then also a post-apprenticeship program to help people be retained in that industry and get matriculated up into leadership positions. So it's one thing to be able to get the job. It's another thing to keep the job and have a high quality of life within that job. So this is how we do it, is through the pre-apprenticeship and post-apprenticeship programs, but also um, a reporting system. So when someone feels like they're being discriminated against or harassed or bullied in the workplace, that there's mechanisms that are neutral and community-led that give people a place to be able to vet their concerns and issues in the absence of having a union. And when there is a union, like the truth is in America, the good jobs are only the unionized jobs. So we have to figure out how do we create a path to these companies being unionized so workers could really have a voice in the quality of life that they're having in these jobs. And I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to be considerate of my other sisters. But we can circle back around if y'all want. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my next question is for Karen. Um, so Karen, you run Apprenticeships for Non-Traditional Employment for Women, ANU, an organization with a 40-year track record of training women for jobs in the construction trades. What best practices and lessons learned can you share with us about how to recruit and retain women in these roles? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you again for the uh, opportunity to speak in front of you and for the Women's Bureau and ILR for bringing this incredible group, uh, powerful group of people that are before me. Uh, ANU has been doing pre-apprenticeship training since 1980. <laughs> Uh, and that program provides the graduates with preferred or direct entry into registered apprenticeship programs, which is critically important. And why, you might ask, are programs that are specific to women and, and gender diverse populations important? Well, what we know is research shows that men will apply for jobs if they have half of the qualifications, while, while women will not will rarely apply for a job unless they have all the qualifications. This is no different in the classroom. This allows a safe space for women to have, find their voice and to be able to, to learn without having that uh, distraction. Um, I always tell people 90% of what we do is raise these people, self-esteem for the people who are included in our program. And we know also that girls dramatically start losing their self-esteem at about age 12. So we are building their self-esteem to uh, allow them to believe in themselves as much as we believe that they can be successful in these positions. It also allows them to create social networks and mentorships with past graduates. Um, and you might ask if it works. We know that areas with Programs that have gender-specific programming have higher numbers of women in the trades. And while we're getting them in the trades, uh, the second question is how do we keep them in the trades? Because as we've alluded to earlier, if they aren't successfully able to complete their apprenticeship and journey out, then 
the investment is questionable. So we need to figure out how to keep them in the trades. And as has been stated many times earlier, one of the issues is the culture of construction. Um, I came into this job in January of 2016, and I, if I had a penny for every time somebody told me the only thing I needed to do was teach women how to have thick skin, for them to be successful, I would be able to retire, which I would like to do someday. But uh, after about a year of hearing it, I said, this is ridiculous. Why are we having this conversation about teaching women to do something instead of having a conversation about what the real underlying issue is, which is harassment, hazing, bullying, and retaliation on the work site? So, Anu decided to create a program called Rise Up, Respect, Inclusion, Safety, and Equity in the Construction Trades. And it's a respectful workplace campaign designed to create a culture that's more inclusive to all people on the job site. We also know that uh, one anti-harassment training is not going to change the culture of construction. It has to be a comprehensive program, which is what we uh, have created and continue to expand on. It has training for all levels, from the executive staff down to the, the apprentices who are getting out on the job, how they advocate for themselves, um, job box talks, worker orientation, clear reporting on who to report situations to, and how to, how to participate and, and be a bystander, intervene in these situations. What we have found, we piloted this. We were lucky uh, to have partners with the city of Seattle and Sound Transit. Um, we were able to pilot this, uh, unfortunately, right when COVID hit, but um, we have been piloting it since 2020. What we have found that incidents of harassment complaints have increased. And you might think, well, that's not good, but actually it's terrific. Because again, um, people were just told to put up with this type of behavior and what they're doing now is not putting up with it. Um, they're, they have a voice, um, they're being employers and contractors and public owners are being held accountable and there's actually action being taken. I, I always tell people you get what you tolerate. If you had children like me uh, and you told them to make their bed, but there weren't any consequences to not making their bed, what happens? They're not going to make their bed, uh, at least not in my house. Um, so if you tolerate harassment, hazing, bullying, and retaliation on your job site, it will continue. The behavior has to stop and there has to be consequences. We've also been able to leverage our federal funding, SNAP, WANTO, DOL, uh, a variety of ways, but one of them is um, spreading this good work to other areas. We actually had a graduate from 1981 uh, one of our first graduating classes, who is now going to be starting a program in Oklahoma. And we are able to uh, help through the WANTO funding to get this program off the ground. Um, with the Rise Up program, we have affiliates. We're trying to scale this. We just had a contractor this week uh, commit to doing this on a $450 million project in St. Louis, as well as WashDOT, um, City of Seattle, King County. They're all using this respectful workplace model, Rise Up model. Uh, it's spreading throughout the country. We have affiliates now in Boston building pathways and Oregon. Oregon Trades Women, and we need more affiliates. We want you to help us do this work. So if you're interested in Rise Up, please see me later. Thank you. Thank you. So Mayor Norton, the city of Rochester recently won the Bloomberg Global Mayor's Challenge Grant for the work being done to get women, particularly women of color, into the construction trades. How did this body of work come about, and what lessons have you learned along the way? Thank you, I'm pleased to be here. It's been such an inspiring day already. I'm gonna share just a little bit about my community to start out so you can understand what, we're, what we started with. So we're Rochester, Minnesota. Minnesota's in the upper Midwest. No, we're not Canada, but right below it. And uh, Rochester's in the southern part of the state. We, all, we have the state's largest employer in our community, which is Mayo Clinic. Um, we have a population of 121,000. 74% white, 26% BIPOC. Our annual income, the median annual income in our community is $81,000. We have a lot of healthcare providers in our community, right? Um, we have about 6% poverty. So that 
that sounds pretty good, maybe to some, but our black median income is only $34,000 and there is 41% poverty among our black population. So we have haves and have nots. We uh, also work, or have something called the Destination Medical Center Initiative, which is an initiative where the state said, um, we're gonna help you redo your downtown and fund infrastructure in your community for $585 million. So we are in the middle, we're very fortunate, in the middle of redesigning our community, which means we need construction workers. But, and we also have a requirement from our state and now our city for workforce participation goals for our black and, and minority women and women, and we have to count them. So we count them, we measure them, and we're falling short time and again. We're working on it, but we know we, we're gonna have at least 2,700 jobs in the next number of years over the years for all this construction that's going on in our community. So we, we found out about a National League of Cities program and a Bloomberg grant program. We combined the two and we said, the thing we need most right now are construction workers and the people that were hurt most during the pandemic, as you've heard time and again here, were our BIPOC women. So what can we do to get those women who are affected and, and being devastated in our community into these great careers and high paying jobs? So what we did was a, um, and I might mention, um, in, when we looked at, we did a lot of research to, to get to this point, what we found out was that about 15% of our population in Rochester are BIPOC women and less than 1% are in the construction industry. So we have a, we have a ways to go. So this was a big challenge. Um, we went about doing some research for about eight months. Um, I, we have the most marvelous staff in Rochester. Chow Mattel is here and she'll be presenting in one of the breakouts. So I do hope you'll go uh, talk to her and learn a little bit more about the wonderful work that they did. Um, but what we found was that when we talked to the women this was our goal, talk to the women and let the women co-design for us the process to get them in the field. We don't wanna do things to people, we want people to do things for themselves and we found a way to support that work. And we used a process called co-design and we now have a little booklet that we can put together. Chow will have that if you wanna sign up for it. Um, we'd be happy to send you an electronic version of the process that we used. But it really was about bringing the women in our community to the table to help us tell us what's missing, what the barriers were, but even more than that, what are the solutions? What did they need in, on the work site, in the job to, to be successful? And we put them at the table, and it was very awkward at first, with our construction industry. So they were there with our union workers. They were at the table time and time and time again with architects and with developers and with builders. And they sat together in some really awkward moments to start, but over time, some really exciting and robust conversations. They built trust among themselves. The women could go back to their communities, gain more information, bring that information back to the table the next time and on and on and on. So we applied for the, the uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor Globals Challenge. There were 631 cities that applied. We made the final 50 and were over the moon to have gotten that far with our process because our process, they kept saying, well, use a community engagement or a co-design process for your grant. Well, that was our grant. Our grant is keeping women at the table the whole time. And so um, we submitted finally our grant and we were one of 15 cities in the world, three in the United States to win a million dollars to get women in construction, BIPOC women in construction. And I will just say a couple things that we learned um, because that's one of the things that you asked. We learned that partnerships and stakeholders at the table from the beginning to the end were really important. Um, we learned that there are a lot of barriers, and in our community, we have a pretty high immigrant population, per particularly um, Somali and East African immigrants. There were cultural issues that you don't necessarily think about that were, were, were coming to mind. Some of it was, you know, kind of the gender socialization, women not asking for what they need, not be, being comfortable complaining on the work site. I see a lot of head nodding, you know, those are, but also things like, my family wants me to go into one of those care fields that we heard about earlier. And of course, in a healthcare community, that's super important, but you know, we're going right alongside that. Um, and if I don't get a scholarship, my family will not pay for me to go into a, a, a career that is not 
normal, that is different, that where you might be the only one. They don't think that's appropriate. So we had to, we, we had to think about that and work that into our plan. Um, opportunity awareness, this has been mentioned earlier today and from several people um, even now, opportunity awareness was just not there. People were not aware of the variety, the depth and breadth of, of careers. It's not just a nail and a hammer. There's so many different varieties of jobs. They, they never even heard of them before. Um, so our plan is to address things in three ways. We're going to hit uh, on the work site all the, the companies that are willing to work with us uh, are going to agree to an on-site assessment of their own facilities. Is it welcoming for women? Is it, so they're doing, there's a whole assessment process they're gonna go through. Um, then we're getting women um, in through higher ed and training. And then there's a third section that's really focused on K-12 and that opportunity awareness that we've talked about working. And people have stepped up. The Girl Scouts want to be involved. Lots of organizations come to us, Jeremiah program, which we have locally. They want to be involved in this because they see the potential. So um, I think we're just starting the process. The piece that was missing for me that was vital is how do we take it to the next step? How do we get women to own those businesses, not just work in them? So the last component that we've just stepped into right now is as we're building out this, this workforce of talented women in high paying careers, we're also gonna make sure that there's an opportunity for them at the end of the day to step into ownership, working with um, this entrepreneurship track as well. So Chow can tell you details if you wanna learn more. Um, she's gonna be doing one of the two workshops and I'm happy to answer questions if we were gonna do that at, at some point. But we are really excited about doing this work with our community, for our community. And I have really high hopes that we're gonna make a difference because we've set goals and we're gonna to work toward them because the women are leading the way. Thank you, that's, thank you. that's great. Um, okay, the next question is for Maggie. So you've been working alongside the policy group for tradeswomen's issues with a great track record building the demand for more women and people of color. So how have you been able to meet and exceed your project goals, building demand for a diverse workforce in construction projects, and what lessons have you learned along the way? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And it is so good to meet all the tradeswomen here today. And I've been fighting for you guys every single day, and you guys know it. You've seen me in action. And <laughs> And it's worth it. When I walk on the side and see we have 10% or 12% women, I am very happy. So it's all worth it, ladies. So uh, as she said, I'm the Director of Compliance for the University of Massachusetts Building Authority, which is a state quasi that lends money to the uh, University of Massachusetts campuses. When we lend out the money, we make sure that we work with the campuses to hire the general contractors and also make sure that uh, compliance goes uh, in the contracts. We have 15.3% minorities and 6.9% 6, 6 female goals. So today, I'm here to share some of our best practices with the intention of inspiring other owners to make the general contractors and construction managers meet a higher standard for compliance on all construction projects. Very ambitious goals, but it can be done. Like Umba, other owners have a social economic obligation to drive the effort through their influence over the general contractors and construction managers. Six years ago, when Umba recruited me for this job, I'm like, I don't have any experience in construction. Why are you looking for me? She said, Maggie, we want you in this position. So I took the job, and my first week on the job, I did a little research. I met with state agencies to see what they were doing uh, what best practices they were using to uh, help their contractors meet the compliance goals. And what I found out, they were all using best practices with no results. They could not meet the 6.9% female. 1%, that's where they were. So I said, God, what am I gonna do? I have to change the game. So what I did, I would, uh, I would have set up best practices for UMBA, you know, with the, uh, Mindset that if we work with our construction managers and our general contractors and contractors to implement our best practices and also help them accountable, they should be able to meet the goals. And guess what? We did better than that 
we are exceeding the goals. So today, I'm proud to say that we are exceeding the workforce compliance goals on most of our construction projects on the University of Massachusetts campuses. The compliance numbers on UMBAS construction projects are at the highest levels in UMBAS history. So yesterday, I had a chance to share some of our, I don't call them best practices anymore. I call them game changers, because we can see, you know, I mean, you know, we can see the difference between, you know, what we used to do, like, when, before I started and now. So the first one is approach. It, it is really important to have an approach like where you work with your contractors, like to help them meet the goals. Now, I'm not trying to punish you for not meeting the goals. I want to work with you. What is the problem? It's, it's, it's very important to make to, like, for your contractors to understand that you're not trying to make them look bad. You just want to help them do the right thing. Commitment. You have to enforce the state workforce diversity goals. Make sure that compliance from, starts from the top. I always tell my, uh, uh, my contractors that you have to have compliance starts from the top. And it is very important to work with everyone in your organization to help understand that compliance is a priority like everything else, like building a building, like uh, doing everything else, compliance is, a top, uh, compliance is a top priority. Communication. Our compliance goals with general, con general contractors are all in all the uh, bid documents contract and pre-bid documents. You have to communicate the goals early on and make sure that diversity and inclusion should be on every meeting agenda with your subcontractors. It's like every day you have to talk about uh, compliance. As the owner, it's important to hire someone to be your compliance person. It shows that you're giving, you know, you're giving it priority as well. And that person will be working with your contractors and subcontractors in the community. Implement, and we also ask the uh, general contractor to designate a person for compliance. Because when you come for the contract, you have to tell us who's going to be the compliance person. We don't want a secretary to be the compliance person. You have to have a compliance person to go out on site to meet with the general contractors and to make sure that that person is on board from day one. Implementation. We ask our contractors to give to submit a, uh, a compliance plan from day one. Show us how you're going to meet your, uh, the workforce goals. What kind of outreach you're going to be doing. Monitoring, that is probably the most important one. Two weeks prior to uh, bringing a con uh, contractor on site, we hold a pre-construction meeting with every subcontractor coming on site. We ask them to submit their workforce projection. I'd like to see who you are bringing on site from day one. Because we do not want uh, contractors to bring a cork within. They have to lay off the people to bring on minority and women. We do not practice that. That's not a good practice. So you need to get to them before they come on site and make sure that they submit their workforce projection. And if they're a union shop, please invite the business agent to the meeting. It's important that you do that as well because Sometimes uh, the contractor will tell you, oh, yeah, they don't have anybody in the hall. You need to confirm that with the hall. And Corkful, it's important that you work with your uh, contractors to help them build their core crew. Because if you have women and, and, and minorities as part of your core crew, you're going to come prepared from day one. So from day one, they're helping you meet uh, your, the compliance goals. And we provide the general contractors uh, 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 a template, so they have to report their numbers every month by subcontractors and by trades. The reason we do that, so I can, when, when we review the uh, report, if a subcontractor is not doing well, we hold what you call collective action meetings. So we make sure we try to help them. So what is the problem? And I will tell you, 90% of the time, the problem is fixed before I meet with them. So that I means it's like, you know, somebody, it's like, where was this woman? Why you, you couldn't find the woman yesterday? So it's important. <laughs> so it's really, it, no, it, it, it's like, I always laugh. I'm like, yeah, good, good. And, and this is just to create the demand side. But one lesson that we learned, we could not do it alone. 
So we had to get involved with the PGTI group to help with the supply side. So we've been working with the, uh, Lisa and Liz. They have been great allies to us. And thank you guys for pushing us every day to do the right thing. Every day they're pushing us, and which is really good. So with, the, uh, with their help, we were able to uh, put together like an access, an access and opportunity committee meeting uh, group. So we have representatives from the unions pre-apprenticeship programs, vocational schools, and workforce development organizations. We meet monthly to review the compliance results on the projects. And we have general contractors at the meeting, so they get to you know, hear from Liz, if you guys know Liz, so you know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> so, so and the group help, uh, they help provide resources and recommendations to contractors and subcontractors who need help with meeting the goals. So, and, and we push our subcontractors to build their core core, as I told you earlier. And one thing I've been doing for the past couple of years, we've been pushing our general contractors to train or hire women to be part of their leadership team. One thing I uh, realized when I started, you know, working for UMBA, I'm part of the hiring committee, and these guys, they would come with no women and no minorities. None. So, you know, I started talking to them, I started working with them, I said, you know, you guys, you have to lead by example. And I can tell you, I had, I had two uh, uh, interviews last week. They brought not just one woman, two, three. I'm like, this is game changer, this is great. That's what we want you to do. This is, you're just doing the right thing by hiring these ladies and they're as smart as you know, all of you guys. And another thing we try to encourage as well, you know, women in the trades, with especially the licensed trades and mecha mechanical trades, you can create your own business. You can establish your own WBE business. Why not? Women business enterprise, you can become your own boss. So we try to, you know, not just work with the women in the trades, but to also help them, you know, have women as part of the leadership, you know, team as well. Thank you. That is, that is, that is great. That's working. Yes, wonderful. Um, this is wonderful. Um, so. You know, it's sort of like a, a theme that, that's coming through from everything that each of you said is kind of twofold. One is the policies and programs that could support the work that you're doing, and then also the partnerships and collaborations. So, Erica, I'd like to go back to you. Um, so, what supports policies programs would make the work that you do easier? I'm so happy you asked that because I forgot to say that earlier. Okay. Yeah. So major. So. You know, when we're thinking about infrastructure, um, re, you know, um, revamping of America, you know, a lot of that money is coming from the federal government to local governments, right? And one of the policy policy things that we're bumping up against is the the, the rules, the rules and guidelines. You know, we want to see more women go into um, manufacturing and into these types of jobs. We want to see more people of color get access to these types of jobs. We want to see more locals get access to these types of jobs, but due to the current way the rules are written, it's illegal for local governments to actually um, require that of their contractors. So basically the way it goes is if federal funds are used to um, pay for local projects given to that government, they cannot say you must hire local or you must hire women or you must hire people of color. So those rules need to be updated. And we're actually running a um, campaign through Jobs and Move America to give cities the power back to be able to you know, have a say in who these funds are going to. So that's going to be critical because that was how we were able to get the partnership with our last um, CBA. It was really based on policies that were established that were um, locally, and it was used to kind of, like, create the path to get to where we were. We're in Alabama organizing. We're in Mississippi organizing. It's not going to be easy. We need all of the support federally and, you know, alliance-wide across the country to be able to really scale up and be able to do the work substantially the way it needs to be done. But, I mean, one is great, but let's try to see, like, it become a standard. Great. Great. So, um, Karen, do you have any thoughts about supports, policies, programs that could make your work easier? Yeah, I'm, I'm blessed. I tell people all the time I couldn't have been put in a better place, in a better time, <laughs> in a better environment than the Pacific Northwest because of the policies and procedures, that policies that we do have around community workforce agreements, um, PLAs, uh, the actual contract requirements that contractors have to have acceptable work site 
training on the site for every worker that walks on. There's a lot of policies, um, but that being said, they have to be extended to different areas and the federal government also has to um, buy into those policies and make those mandated. So respectful workplace training policies on all construction sites that are federally funded would be something that would be helpful. Mayor Norton. Sure, so I would add uh, to that that it helps to have leadership from the top, whether it be your mayor or your city administrator, if you're talking about city government. Um, and, and having federal partners is fantastic. I love this idea of, you know, we require uh, workforce goals for minority and, and women in, in the construction fields as part of our state and local projects. It'd be great to have the same thing happen for the, at the federal level so that we're all working on the same page. And one of the things that I, I failed to mention that I want to add in here that, that links to some of the things these ladies have said, which is, Women need to feel safe on the work sites. We've talked about that, and I heard people talk about that earlier. And one of the things that we've, we're putting in place, and we'll see how it goes because we're piloting it, is we're gonna have navigators on the site who are independent, who will, uh, one navigator will be there for the business group and watch to make sure they're staying in compliance with um, what they should as far as our expectations uh, for, for women and minority employees. And then we're gonna have navigators out there for the women themselves. And those navigators will be the ones that will do the talking and help negotiate things that need to be done on site so women don't have to worry about retaliation. So women can raise issues without worrying about their job being at risk. So I think these navigators working together um, is also going to be uh, helpful, and, and we're piloting that, um, and the businesses have agreed to it. So uh, we're excited to see that happen. But I, I just wanted to add, I really do think you need, uh, you, we, we need to have, we need to keep gaining support. We have the people in this room. We need to multiply this at, um, at levels of city and federal government and state as well. Thank you. Maggie. Before I answer the question, Liz asked me to share something with you guys. <laughs> uh, there's an executive order, 11-246, that sets hiring goals for women and people of color, and they apply to all infrastructure money. Okay. So if you have any question, Liz, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and so Maggie, I was curious, um, are there any supports, policies, programs that would help make the work that you do easier? Uh, two things I can think of. Setting compliance goals on every project. Yeah. And also accountability. You know, making sure that these goals are being met. It's very important. And sometimes I think 6.9% is too low. You know, but, but let me tell you, we, we would have, you know, to raise the 6.9% uh, to like 10%. I have projects like, I would tell you, 10, 12% women, a lot of my projects. Yeah. So if we can reach 10, point, you know, 10%, 12%, so why not raise this like 6.9%? But we would also have to work with the, uh, lo with the unions in, the, in their training directors to hire more women to recruit more women and minorities into the trades. And, that, and we uh, started this year to uh, uh, think of ways how we can work with the training directors. So. Great. Actually, let's stay there. That's actually, you know, um, you know, we talked about policies and rules, but also partnerships and collaborations. Mm -hmm. So in addition to, you know, building trades, mm -hmm. the unions, who else would you want to partner with and collaborate with to try to make this better? Oh. I, we believe in creating the pipeline. If you don't do that, you're not going to find the women. And we've been working with the uh, vocational schools. You know, we're part of the uh, Mass uh, um, Girls in Trades, you know, out in uh, Western Mass, and we have in Boston and Central, Central Mass as well. We've been working with them for the past five years, and now they are 20%, you know, females. And we won't, we won't stop until we see 20% female on our sites. I'm telling you guys. And also we work with... Uh, community organizations like work for, that deals with workforce development. It's very important that you do as well. And you can also work with the high schools. And uh, guidance counselors at the high school, they're very good. Uh, uh, it's a very good uh, resource as well because some of their kids, before they drop out, they can, you know, ask me if they want to go into the trades. 
you know, and uh, building trades, vocational school, uh, training directors, uh, community organizations that deals with workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mayor Norton, when you look at the work that you guys are doing, um, who else, who do you recommend partnering with, to collaborating with, to make this more effective? Our, uh, when we started this, it was all about partners. So we ha we had partners with us the whole time, uh, partners from the construction and trades industry, including our, um, our unions. Um, we have uh, groups in addition to that, um, Workforce Development Inc., uh, Higher Education, K-12, um, nonprofit organizations have been at the table the whole time uh, to help us develop this. And uh, I did want to mention um, some of those nonprofit organizations do offer scholarships. And I mentioned earlier that some of our girls told us that a partial scholarship isn't enough. Um, if I'm going to break a, a familial rule or a cultural norm, I'm going to need more support than part time. I'm going to need someone to stick with me the whole time. We did hear that. And I also heard from one of our nonprofits that offers scholarships. And this isn't just for BIPOC women, but more globally, we have organizations in town that offer scholarships. And I just learned this past week, Rotary Club was one of them, that 60% of those scholarships are, go unused which was heartbreaking because we celebrate the scholarships that are given, but they're not enough to cover the tuition for a student that may not be able to get the rest of the funding and whose family or they do not, they're not able to fund it themselves. And so for me, I think it's going back to the table with some of these groups that have been thinking they're doing something really helpful, but are starting to recognize that it's not enough and let's fill that gap of not enough to make sure that we can provide and work with our, the unions and our colleges to make sure that, it's, that everything that's needed to get women into the workforce, to get our, our BIPOC community fully employed and engaged in a career that they want is covered. And I think our grant and also I would say linking with the federal government on funds with all the infrastructure funds we've, we've recently learned, you know, have been passed and have heard about, we've gone uh, up to the federal government already and asked and, and won $750,000 to supplement our Bloomberg grant. We went, we made the ask, we told them what we wanted to do, and they were willing to fund it. So I think also thinking of the federal government as a partner that can help us move along in multiple ways is a good idea. Karen? Yeah, well, I think everybody has to be at the table. Specifically, um, the people we're trying to serve, the women, people of color that we're trying to get into these jobs, um, leaders. I also think the people who you think are your enemies, those are the people you should also be inviting to the table. Um, I don't. I think we all need to work together. We have a, a system, a labor system, where women and people of color are uh, disproportionately in undervalued jobs. In, in um, and there's a reason for that. They're keeping us there because money is power. And we will never have social justice until we have financial justice. So we all need to work together to make sure that happens. Erica? I like her. Um, so, um, you know, it's definitely a collaborative effort. This is something we cannot do in a vacuum. So, you know, for, you know, JMA, we have coalitions standing up all across America that includes faith-based groups, environmental groups, um, human rights, civil rights groups, labor, all working together trying to figure out how do we overcome these obstacles of creating good jobs in America? And when we think about workforce development, what we're doing is we're convening tables of experts in the industry. So like in Alabama, the lay of the land, people who are thinking about workforce development, government systems are thinking about workforce development. There are some nonprofit organizations that's thinking about none. Um, workforce development. There's um, direct service groups that's thinking about workforce development, but there's a gap, right? So what we have to do is figure out where the gap is by talking to everybody who's in the workforce development field and pull them together and identify those gaps and then work together to figure out how do we bridge those gaps. 
you know, working with community colleges, that's another university systems and community colleges. Alabama has the most HBCUs in America. It's 14, including community colleges, which is a fun fact, but very relevant because this is where we're trying to build this work up at and building relationships with these community colleges and giving these students access directly to these employers who we have relationships with to try to get them in those workplaces and then let them get up into the leadership because what we see in these jobs is most of these people are coming in through temp services. It's a revolving door. They're getting into the jobs, but they're only working on the front line, which means that they're probably more likely to get injured, not be able to sustain a job because the work is more brutal. So what we have to do is figure out how do we not only get them in there, but keep them in there, and it's through these partnerships and collaborations. So the employer is going to be an important partner. You know, um, our employer um, partner told us, like, we have the opportunity to expand our operation and produce more, but we don't have the workforce. You guys have to help us get this workforce. So we're targeting women, and we're pulling women in. We're targeting people of color, and we're pulling them in, and we're putting them in front of the employer, and it's on a relationship that we've established that's mutually beneficial. The community benefits because they have good jobs. The employer benefits because they have a quality workforce. It's going to take all of us working together and having conversations and pulling together a plan to actually create this pipeline and sustain the workforce once they get in there. Great example. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got a final question for each of you. And this is fun. This is the, what is your moonshot wish for this moment? Erica, you want to go first? that green manufacturers who are opening up their business look at New Fly and be like, oh my God, they figured it out. They got it right. Let's all do it. When the face of construction looks like this instead of the way it does right now. I would have to say when the women in my community tell me that they have what they need and want, we're there. I'd have to say when we call the locals or in looking for women and they tell me we have all the women you want, Maggie. <laughs> that is great. Uh, well, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you all. Sorry for that slight delay. That panel was amazing. Um, just want to thank Mia and all of our phenomenal speakers for the thoughtful conversation. Um, I, uh, I'm going to invite a friend up with me here um, to introduce our special guest for the afternoon. Um, but at this moment, I'd like to turn the floor to Marcia Santelaire Finn, who is the owner of Bright Start Early Care Preschool. Where are you going? <laughs> who started her, her small business believing strongly that early care providers should be fairly compensated. And that includes access to paid time off and paid family medical leave um, and mental health supports. And Marcia, who you are also a nurse by training, I understand, has spoken publicly about the benefits um, that you have seen from your own experience as a business owner of these kinds of good quality job supports. Um, and you know firsthand that care is infrastructure and that care is essential and that also care is in crisis. So Marcia, thank you for your vocal advocacy for caregivers and families and small businesses and workers. And we're delighted to have you join us. And um, give me one second to see. Oh, I thought something was happening. So the floor is yours. The mic is yours. <laughs> It's okay. Well, good afternoon. I love the energy in the room. It's such a pleasure to be here today. So as Wendy said, I am Marcia St. Hilaire Finn, and I'm the founder and president of Bright Start Early Care and Preschool right here in D.C. 
We established in 2002 as a home daycare with five children. And today, we have three centers. And by the end of 2023, we'll, have, we'll be serving 285 students with 60 employees. I've worked hard to balance paying my teachers well and ensuring the care we provide families is affordable. And I advocate every day for equitable social benefits and pay for early childhood teachers and leaders. The current childhood landscape and is a crisis and in my lens is dire. The cost of providing quality childcare is very high. It is pricing families out and in turn creating scarcity and forcing mothers out of the job market. This crisis was not only made more complex by the pandemic. Small businesses like mine have been advocating for local and federal investments for years, calling on Congress for urgent action on paid leave and investment in our care economy. Small businesses can't provide this on our own within the private insurance market. We've been priced out. We need bold federal investments to level the playing field. In the same way I need my roads to get to work, my employees and I need a care infrastructure in place with time to heal for employees when they need it, and affordable and accessible childcare. We can't build back better and stronger if we don't address these long standing gaps that have been holding our economy back, particularly for black women like myself. The person I'm introducing next gets all parts of this equation. He is the second gentleman of the United States, Mr. Doug Emhoff, and he's been all across the country talking about things we in this room care about, equal pay. He has also cared about making sure women have more access to jobs in construction, manufacturing, and STEM, especially at this time when Congress passed big investments in infrastructure, and importantly, valuing care work and care workers. He's one of our biggest allies for gender equity and is helping to bring more visibility to this work and to the commitment the president and certainly the vice president have to e equity. Please welcome, help, welcome the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia, thank you so much. What an introduction. Thank you all. And Marcia, thanks for all you do. Um, I've heard all about your work. I just heard what you were saying. I agree with everything. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No. Um, but I know the work that you're doing to ensure that parents can continue working uh, without having to worry about these massive expenses for childcare is amazing. And we need more people like you doing it. But I agree with what you said. This is something we've been fighting for uh, and we're gonna keep fighting for it. We need it, we need paid uh, childcare, family leave, but you all know that. Okay. Well, thank you. But I'm actually here on behalf of President Biden <laughs> and my wife. Vice President Harris. And our amazing First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Um, I'm here on their behalf to thank you, uh, to thank all of our partners in the administration, all of our partners out in the community, and everyone who's doing all this work each and every day. I'm just here to thank you, and it's a real honor to be here. Uh, I also want to thank Cornell University's Worker Institute. Where's Cornell University? I hear that your Equity at Work initiative is expanding employment definitions of fairness and justice in ways that we can all benefit. So thank you. I love these 
public-private partnerships. We're all in this together. So thank you, Cornell University and all the other groups that are sponsoring. Uh, we've got advocates here. We've got nonprofit leaders. We've got elected officials. Everyone, like I said, is in this together. So for all of you out here who took the time to be here and all the work that you're doing, thank you. Uh, you can give yourself a round of applause. You earned it. Come on. Um, and I really want to acknowledge, uh, a, a, who's become a really good friend in the administration, someone that is a real champion in the fight for, for equity in the workplace, the director of the Women's Bureau, my friend, Wendy chun -Hoon. Wendy. So I'm not just saying that because I had to. I'm saying it because we've done the work together and we've traveled the country together uh, and I've, I've just seen the passion, the, the intelligence, the dedication, and she's taught me a lot uh, about this issue, as has everyone uh, in the administration. Uh, she's passionate, and she is a fighter for women in male-dominated industries, and she's going to keep doing that. Um, she's actually one of the first people in the administration that I did substantive work with and traveled with. Um, I think it was only a month in, Wendy, we went to St. Louis and we did a listening session on equal pay, which is something that we need to keep fighting for. And you remember, we met um, a woman named Paralee Gladney. It just stuck with me for a year and a half. Um, she was a home health care worker. She told me how much she loved her job. It didn't pay a lot but she loved doing it because she loved helping people. And so she was okay with the long hours and the low pay. But um, she also shared how heartbreaking it was when she got laid off from that job that she loved so much because of the pandemic. And as we all know, and I saw with my own eyes out there, everything that was bad before the pandemic was made worse, and in some cases, much worse. And she was really feeling that. Um, it was also almost impossible for her, she told us, to find another job um, because the pandemic at that time made home visits too dangerous. Um, so I saw it firsthand. And it was um, really terrible because I saw that women bore the brunt of, of these things in so many different areas. Many lost their jobs. Many had to work two jobs, their job, and then teaching their kids school uh, at home. Um, I saw some who were victims of domestic violence, who were literally locked in their home with their abuser. We met those folks, and we heard their stories. Um, and again, these inequities, they didn't just happen because of COVID. They've always been there. They've been made worse, and it's our job to make them better. And that's a lot of what we're working on here, Wendy. Um, but I've heard these stories all over the country. And I don't, do, like, I don't do this. I haven't traveled to almost 40 states just to, just to travel. Part of the, the best part about this job is listening and hearing these stories. And then what do we do? Well, we bring them back to the administration and we just try to turn what we heard into action. This administration is about action and responding to the needs of the American people. And it is a whole of government approach, especially as it relates to gender equity and pay equity and fairness and childcare and family leave and all the things that we're fighting for. Uh, there's a whole of government plan. We have our first ever gender equity council, gender policy council, sorry. And I, I spent a lot of time with them, talking to them, working with them. And it's just another example of, of how we do it here. We see a problem. A lot of these problems are hard. And it's not just one solution. And it's not just one, one area of our administration that needs to work on it. A lot of these things are related. And we need to treat them that way. Um, we know President Biden and Vice President Harris my wife. Um, <laughs> I just never get sick of saying that. Um, uh, they, as you know, you know them, they put 
families, especially working families, right at the heart of the agenda for the administration. And during the pandemic and up until now, um, I've seen my wife cast those tie-breaking votes on laws that are truly generational and have lifted children out of poverty and have tried to level the playing field, had have literally saved our country, starting with uh, the American Rescue Plan, where she got up and, and cast that, that 51st vote um, that provided money in, in people's pockets directly, shots in arms. It, it got small businesses reopened. It let local communities literally run their governments. And I, to this day, when I travel around, I'll, I'll, I'll meet the local mayor, I'll meet the local city manager, it doesn't matter what political party, and they will, thank you so much, thank you so much. Please let Joe and Kamala thank you because of the American Rescue Plan. And of course, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're now seeing the effects of that money pouring in all over the country. And what is that? It's um, bridges and roads and, and tunnels and broadband for everyone. But what uh, it's also jobs. It's jobs going for thousands and thousands of people and good paying jobs, which is what we're trying to do here. And then just a few weeks ago, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to lower costs, health care. Uh, it's going to it's the biggest investment we've had in, in our climate in generations. It's something we need. Again, she cast that 51st vote, and um, uh, it's, um, one day I'll tell the story of what it's like to be behind the scenes when you're waiting to get the call to go cast a historic groundbreaking vote. And then when she leaves, you kind of watch it on TV, and she comes back, and we're just like, yeah, you did. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Um, but this, again, it's jobs. We're going to lower costs and we're going to create jobs as we make this massive investment in our future. Um, but my wife, uh, she's always been a leader and a leader on issues as it pertains to women. I remember all the time when she'd be campaigning and someone would say, hey, let's talk about the economy. And she'd say, I'm so glad you want to talk about women, <laughs> right? <laughs> because when <laughs> Of course we're talking about women. When we lift women up, we lift up the economy, don't we? It's not. I, I just can't stand when I hear it's, it's, it's one or the other. It's a zero sum game where if we lift some woman up, someone else is losing. That's not true. Everyone wins. When we lift up women, we lift up our country, we lift up our economy. It's the right thing to do, and this guy is going to keep saying this until I'm blue in the face. So, um, but that's my wife. She's been doing this work ever since I've known her and the 20 years before in her career. Uh, it's something that she will continue to work on, whether it's maternal health, whether it's getting lead out of pipes, uh, whether it's supporting victims of, of abuse and violence. She's going to be there and continue to do that work so women and this country can succeed. Um, I am so proud to be a part of this administration. I'm so proud to do the work that I've been able to do and use this microphone to advocate for things that are important to all Americans, uh, including making sure that women um, have fairness in the workplace, fairness on pay, fairness on health care, fairness on reproductive rights, and fairness on all these things. And men, men, we need to be allies. We all need to be allies. All these things are not women's issues. They're issues for all of us. And don't, I, know, I know us guys sometimes. Don't just think you're being supportive. Don't just say you're being supportive. Be supportive. Actually be supportive. So thank you all uh, for this opportunity to, to spend a few moments with you. It's really an honor to be able to do this and speak to you. And I'm going to continue to get up every morning and look in that mirror and say, what more can I do? And I know all of you are going to do that as well. And together, um, we are going to build a better, a more fair, more just country. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.
All right, that was exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been an extraordinary day. Thank you to the second gentleman um, for offering those incredible remarks. Here's the mantra of the day. When we lift women, we lift the economy. Yes, <laughs> and I would also say that we need a few more good men like the second <laughs> gentleman. <laughs> We, we know how important gender equity is to all of you and to this administration, and so we look forward to working together in the years ahead. Um, to our virtual audience and to all of you physically here in this building um, that has been named very purposefully after the first woman to ever serve as a cabinet secretary, Frances Perkins, <laughs> we are honored that you spent the day with us here at the Department of Labor. Um, we'll offer couple of thoughts each, and then we're going to give some instructions about what's next. Uh, to, to our virtual audience. Oh, no. I, I, so today we heard uh, many of you, from many of you, starting with the deputy secretary, about how girls have been told no, and what that does when you carry that your life, um, what it's like being the only one, what that lost potential is to our economy. We heard some daunting facts and figures about women, and particularly women of color, and, and around employment, occupational segregation, how our economy systemically undervalues caregiving, and how much work there is to be done to advance gender and racial equity. We've heard about how we're going to work hand in hand to get this done how equity and excellence go hand in hand. And that's what we're about to, to do next um, as we shift. And we also heard about the union advantage, the benefits of being a union member, uh, and also came out through the, the day of the power that it gives to have a voice at work. And finally, we heard about the importance of baking equity gender, racial, disability, LGBTQ equity into the job creation that this country is about to do through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, so that we can build pathways to better and good jobs for women and for communities of care. Thank you. Um, with that, we are going to bid farewell to our virtual audience. Thank you for joining us today. We're concluding our live stream, and we're all going to move into these afternoon workshops. So for those of you in the room, uh, now is that opportunity that we've been looking forward to all day to get to know each other, to connect the work that we're doing in our communities. Um, we have eight workshops, and so uh, they are going to repeat twice. So you have the option to go to two. Um, so pick your top two now. Uh, they're on a variety of topics ranging from addressing gender-based violence and harassment in the workplace to building an accessible and just economy. Uh, remember the QR codes from this morning? I see many people getting that paper out. Um, you're going to use the QR code to figure out what the topics are, figure out the two that you most want to go to, figure out the rooms where they are, um, and as you exit the Great Hall, and I think we're going to this elevator deck, uh, please look out again for Women's Bureau colleagues and Cornell colleagues who are going to escort you up to the workshops uh, and tell you what floor they're on. And with this, we are bringing uh, this room to a close. The summit is going to conclude right after the workshops at about 4.45. Uh, but we'll be here. We're going to gather. Some of us will gather back here um, in case we want to keep the conversations going. So please drop by. But really, enjoy the workshops. Thank you for being with us today. Yes, thank you. Enjoy. And please come back at the end if you can. <laughs> so funny, yes. Yeah.